Good afternoon and welcome to our closing plenary. Um, we are one, we're going to start this afternoon with our keynote, Gabriel Aladois, who is a former migrant farm worker from St. Lucia, an island in the Eastern Caribbean. He's an organizer with the collective Justice for Migrant Workers, better known as JFOMW, for almost a decade. Gabrielle is currently an outreach worker with the neighborhood organization, TNO, working with migrant. <laughs> you, can tell, you think TNO is in the audience? <laughs> he's an active, sorry, he's currently an outreach worker with TNO, the neighborhood group, working with migrant workers across Ontario. Gabrielle was an activist in resident at the University of Guelph, the first person to hold that position, which brought activists and researchers together. He is the author of the recently published book, Harvesting Freedom, by publisher Between the Lines, and, win and is winner of the 2023 Speakers Award. Please, a warm welcome for Gabrielle Aladoua. Listen. Special greetings to each and everyone. It is said Canada is the most diverse country in the world, and Toronto is the most diverse city in the world. When I look at this audience here, I see diversity. I'm seeing people from. Oh, I can see people from different continents. I hope none of you are as confused as me because. Free is for me. My father is of Indian descent. I associate with Asia. My mother is of African descent. I relate to Africa. And now I am in Canada. I relate to America. I all as confused. I don't know which continent to choose. I all as confused as I am. And that is what our heading is about today. That is what we want to focus a little about today. Is Canada. Is Toronto, is your organization, and are you prepared? That is why there's professional development. Are you prepared to be welcoming and inclusive for all those people coming from all different continents? That is what I want to focus on today. And to focus on that, I want to tell you, we just had food a while ago. Did we have a healthy meal a while ago? We are all connected by food. But I believe, personally, I believe that the food that we eat can be the safest form of our medicine. I also believe that the food that you eat can also be the slowest form of your poison. Are you concerned? I want to, I want to tell you a couple of other things. I wear different hats. And let me see if I have a few of them here. I wear different hats. I wear the hat of an advocate. I also wear the hat of an offer. I also wear the hat of an outreach worker. I also wear the hat of many, many other things. And to tell you, I'm not too sure whether I'm doing the right thing. Oh, here we are. Um, back, back. I am not sure if I am doing the right thing. Okay. I want to tell you, in Canada, I discovered I am many things. I discovered I'm a god. My very surname, Aladwa has roots. Allah is the Muslim name for God. I am a God. I want to tell you, I'm also an angel. I know I didn't come with my wings today because I knew the doors were too small. <laughs> By very name, Gabriel makes me an angel. But I want to tell you, being a migrant worker, my labor is used, and that's what we'll be talking about. My labor is used to create somebody's heaven. And that is what the stories of migrant workers are. We'll get into that. I want to tell you also, I discovered in Canada, I'm a slave. 
like my mother's and sisters, my labor in Canada has been exploited. I'm also, I'm half human in Canada. The very constitution of Canada denies me basic human rights. Am I second class? Am I first class? Or do I have no class? We'll talk a little about that. I also discovered I am a lab rat. A lab rat. What does that mean? The, all the things that they've tried on us, short-term employment, contracts, all of those things that they've tried on us, they're now bringing it into mainstream employment. The things they've tried on us, they want to try it on you. Are you really willing to, 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 to fight back or are you willing to accept? I have a few props off and on. I'll be going to the backstage because I have a little bag of tricks there. I'm pretty sure everybody can see this, right? We all know what it is. If I ask a chef what it is, he'll see so many things. If I ask a cook, they'll say so many things. If I ask a child, they'll tell me that's a vegetable. But the challenge for us today, you know what's the challenge? The things you cannot see. How many seeds are in there? That is the challenge. When you see a migrant worker, what do you see? And I want to tell you, the topic today is about people who produce those food. They are made invisible. They are made invisible. Why am I here today? Because you do not hear those stories. Why am I here today? To let you know that there are people that we, we serve or we do not even serve or we turn a blind eye to that are very vulnerable. And today, I want to tell you a couple of little things like VD. In, um, in school, in my home country, there were some subjects I did very well at and there were some I was very weak at. Two subjects I was really, really weak at was science and the other one was Spellings. VD, as a child, I saw VD. Whatever it meant, I, I wasn't very good at science, so I, I, I always had problems if I struggled with it. But today in Canada, I'm studying that, I understand that VD, and today that's what I want to talk about, V stands for vulnerable. And D stands for dignity. Are you in your organization serving vulnerable people? And are you doing that with dignity? And that is the purpose of Professional Development Day. That is why we are here today. I will talk about vulnerability. I also want to tell you, in school, I struggled with science. In school, I struggled with spellings. In school, science. Very early on in my life, I came across D, 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 T. Do we know what that stands for? That's, that, that's that, like the longest word you'll see in science. So that, that, uh, things like that helped me to dis, um, discourage me from studying science. But in Canada today, what did I discover? D, D, T. What does D, D, T stand for? D, D, T. Canada says to Europeans, we cannot deny you freedom. Canada says to Europeans, I cannot deny you rights. Canada says to Europe, I cannot tie you to a farm. D, D, T. The same Canada says to migrant workers from the global south, D, E, T. Who is a migrant worker in Canada? D. From the very constitution of Canada, migrant workers are denied, denied basic things. We are denied the right to participate in family life, denied the right to, 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 um, to be protected by ordinary, and that is the very constitution of Canada. Is that an accident or is that by design? E, excluded. The laws that are designed to protect workers in Canada, migrant workers are excluded. Recently was Thanksgiving Day, a holiday. That's when you shared your best meal with your family. Your best days in Canada are migrant workers' worst days in Canada because we excluded. And I will get into that. I hope I have enough time to get into that. We need to get into the details. And I said T. What does T stand for? D-E-T. T. Tide. Migrant workers have a tide work permit. Migrant workers have a 
tied work permit. So let me summarize all of that together. To be tied to your employer, denied so much, and excluded from so much. How would you call that? Do you have a dictionary? How would you call that? You denied so much, excluded from so much, and you're tied to your employer. How would you call that? How would you call that? And that's basically the food that you've had. And in Canada, you know the, the amazing thing about Canada? We are made invisible. You see all those lights that are of me? Yet still we cannot see the migrant. We are made invisible. And I want to bring some visibility to that. But I do not have a PowerPoint. However, I'm going to ask my colleague to help me with some posters. And uh, I need to shift the location a little bit. So we will go this way. So thank you. Thank you. We go this way. In front of the yeah. yeah. Thanks for your patience. Shift in front of the podium. Front of the podium. Yeah. Yeah. Put up this one. Okay. The back. The back. The back. The back. Yeah. Beautiful. So you can see it right there. Yeah. Um. Okay, we can see it on the board, right? Great. I love when the politicians say. A Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. Complete. I love where they say from coast to coast to coast. Everybody's included. But they can never say a worker is a worker is a worker because there's first class and second class. Migrant workers are excluded. Um, where is my PowerPoint? <laughs> the second. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I bring all the others. I bring all, you can bring all the others right there and you put your chair right there. I have a moving PowerPoint, right? <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see, you see the benefits of being a migrant worker? Your PowerPoint, everything is different, right? Um, now listen to that. If that does not make you feel different, and you, to me at a conference, at a summit, you have to rock the boat and be a different person. If that does not rock you, if that does not touch you to the core, then you're in the wrong job. When I talk to migrant workers, they tell me in Canada, the hierarchy of people that have been treated with respect and so on, that is what, that is what they come up with. They said that in their opinion or from their experience, children in Canada are treated with a lot of rights, a respect. Women, the elderly, the pets, even the lawn outside, I treat it with a lot of respect. And somewhere, somewhere, somewhere at the bottom, maybe men are found somewhere there. I don't know. <laughs> somewhere, the men, men is somewhere. I'm not too sure. They're not sure. But also at the bottom are people of color. Indigenous people are somewhere at the bottom. But they cannot see a place where migrant farm workers, migrant workers are. They cannot see themselves in the hierarchy. The, are they first class? Are they second class or are they no class? That is the hierarchy. And where is that? Where am I talking about that? South of the border or right here? The food that we very, uh, we ate a while ago. That is what we just did there. We are made invisible. No class. Where is my PowerPoint? <laughs> you can put your chair right there. The, 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 the thing is that to tell you only part of a story essential is to lie to you. To tell you a part of the story essential is to lie to you. I'm just begging you to get the whole story. To get a complete story. And in 30 minutes, 90 minutes, I don't know, I can never tell you the whole story. Um, a while ago, a friend told me, I don't want to bring him up, he told me he has TB. And I asked him, why? What happened? It kind of, uh, that's not a common thing. He told me he has a terrific body. <laughs> now, we just had good food. I hope everybody has a terrific body. Because if our body is terrific, that means we have lots of systems that are working well. Our immune system, our, everything is working well. Now, similarly, the farm program that I'm going to talk about, the migrant workers program I'm going to talk about, I, it's difficult to tell you all of those different, it's so complex, right? But as much as possible, I'll try to keep it simple. I'm hoping 
by keeping it simple, I'll give you the skeleton, and I'm hoping that I'll say something to you. I'm hoping that um, I'll inspire you, to encourage you to, to get the other pieces and add it to the skeleton so you can get the whole picture, because it's difficult to tell you the whole story. But at the end of the day, we cannot change. What I'm about, when, um, as I move forward, we cannot change the past, never. I'm not asking you to change the past, never. I'm not asking you to change the past. What I'm asking you to do is to change our blindness, to change our blindness. To, um, if you can shift the, your focus a little bit, that, is, that would be a victory for me, to shift our focus, our blindness. The, the, the issues are right there on our nose, under our nose, but, but we, we become blinded to it for so many reasons. We cannot change the past. However, we can create a better future. We can create a safer society. We can create a more inclusive society. And that is why we have professional development, right? The little things, we, can, we don't know everything, but we learn a little, a little, a little, and get better and better and become more inclusive. Um, where is my PowerPoint? <laughs> you can bring your chair, bring your chair right there. Where's the chair? Okay, um, I, would like, I would like to draw your attention to a, a, um, a documentary. It's called Life. L-I-F-E and death. Please watch that documentary. It, it spells out, it spells out how the rich or the developed countries are able to get cheap labor, cheap materials and so on, because they have a lot of institutions in place to create that wide divide. Please, I encourage you to watch Life, L-I-F-E and death, D-E-B-T. Now, my PowerPoint. To get, to get into that, I want to tell you, the program that brought me to Canada and the program that, basically the food that you just ate, the program that's bringing workers in Canada, the one that particularly brought me, it's called the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program. And in Canada, there are lots of temporary foreign workers program. I want to tell you, there's one political party who tells you that these programs, they are so complicated that it's very difficult to understand. They are so complicated that it is difficult for the workers to navigate it. And in Canada, it is impossible to get justice. Where did I say? In Canada. Let us get into it. Where's my PowerPoint now? Am I going too fast? Um, do you like a story? Okay, I have lots of stories. Who is a migrant worker in Canada? Who is a migrant farm worker in Canada? Who is a migrant farm worker in Canada? One of the subjects I told you I was very weak at is spellings. I, um, one of the words I really struggled with is debt. Whenever the teacher asked me to spell debt, I would say D-E-T. One day, I, uh, my mother became aware. She told me to spell that. I, I said D-E-T. She said it's missing a B. I said D-E-T-B. <laughs> I had all the letters, but I got it wrong. But today, was I a poor speller? Was, was I someone who was poor at spelling? Or was I a visionary? What do I mean by that? Who is a migrant worker in Canada? D-E-T. Denied. Excluded. and tied. Who is a migrant worker? We have exploitative visas. The visas we have is very, very exploitative. Who is a migrant worker? We are made second class from the constitution. We are denied so many basic things. We are made second class. We are half human. In are we human beings? We are made half human. And let me tell you, if you look on the wall there, consistently, consistently, Canada is 150 whatever years, consistently Canada always, 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 had a program in place that dehumanize and exploit people. Are we welcoming? Are we treating our clients with dignity? Who is a migrant worker in Canada? We do not have privilege. <laughs> now, the word privilege, it will take us the whole afternoon to talk about that, right? Um, status. 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 What does status mean? What does status mean? In Canada, status is, in Canada, status is a two-edged sword. Status is a two 
edge sword. It cuts both ways. What does that mean? If I have status, I have an open work permit. It takes care of a lot of my labor vulnerabilities. If I have status, I'm not concerned about being deported. It takes care of my immigration vulnerabilities. But with migrant workers, we have very precarious status. We have very precarious status. Migrant workers are excluded from employ a lot of the basic laws that are designed to protect what my, um, to designed to protect workers, migrant workers are excluded. The other thing is, the rights that migrant workers have, there are very few rights, and they don't even know about those rights. And that is what I'm going to talk about, how it's important. And in the presentation that was here before lunch, the question was raised. Migrant workers are so vulnerable that the employers would send them home just for speaking up. And some organization, like in Niagara, they said, uh, it's only after the fact, after the fact that the workers have been sent home, that they, the organization will get to know about it. Because so few of them know about the little rights that they have. Let, one minute, one minute, I'm going to buy some time now. Yeah, let me talk a little about the Canadian food system. The Canadian food system, the food we just ate here. I want to tell you, number one, I believe, personally believe that the food I'm eating, the food that you're eating, it could be, if we eat well, our food is our medicine. If we don't eat well, medicine will be our food. Number two, he who controls the land controls your food. He who controls your food controls you. He who controls the land controls your food. He who controls your food controls you. Number three, are you concerned? That's my question to you. Are you concerned? Are you concerned whether your food is being grown by those who respect the soil, respect the environment, respect migrant workers? Are you not concerned whether they exploit the soil, exploit the environment, exploit migrant workers? I want to ask you too. In Canada, in Canada, it is legal, it is legal, it is legal to exploit the soil, to exploit the environment, to exploit workers. It is legal. That's not anything illegal. It is legal. The other thing is, during the pandemic, there, right now there are no more migrant workers in Canada. I keep, make, I keep uh, making that mistake, saying migrant workers. In Canada, there are no more migrant workers. The government said, we got a promotion. We are <laughs> essential workers. The country cannot run with us. Essential workers. But listen to that. We are essential, yet still what do, what, how are the workers treated? With disrespect and so on essential the nice and comforting words of the politicians now if you are not concerned because if you do not push the politicians everything will remain as is are you concerned the other thing is the canadian food system is built on race people from the global south it's built on race we have to accept that that's a fact number four number number seven i want to tell you whether you go to jamaica whether you go to cuba Mexico, Australia, food, clothing, shelter, basic, basic necessities. Food, clothing, shelter, basic. However, in Canada, in Canada, food is not, food is not a basic necessity. Food is a commodity, money making. Profit comes before you. If all the food that's produced in Canada is very fertile. If all the food that's produced in Canada is allowed to go to the market, you don't know what the real cost of food will be. Canada has a supply management in place. You know how much milk they said has been dumped just to make sure that the price remains profitable? Are you concerned? Now, the other thing, too, we are all in Toronto. The more we move away from the countryside from our food, the more disconnected we become. Are you concerned? The more disconnected you are from the land, Lots of things are happening. And the last thing I would say, okay, I just said it, supply management. Now, where is my PowerPoint? Yeah, good. Now, we want to talk about vulnerability. I've checked the, the meaning, I've checked the meaning of vulnerable. I've checked the meaning of vulnerable, and I would encourage you to read about vulnerability. But listen to that. That's the very definition of vulnerability. For somebody to be tied to an employer, 
denied so much and excluded from so much, that is the very definition of vulnerability. Let us get into that. Who is a migrant worker? By definition in Canadian law, definition, denied the right to vote. Denied the right to vote. The same politicians who are creating those unjust laws, you can't vote, they're untouchable. PPP, our poverty in Canada is because of the unjust policies of the politicians. And they're six feet away from us because we're not allowed to vote. Who is a migrant worker? We are denied. Another name for migrant worker is denied. Denied the right to participate in culture and community. Does that make me a human being or second class or half human in Canada? And that is enshrined in Canada. That's an accident. Is it drunk people who are writing that or is it by design? What have you said? And that is why, that is why I will figure out in the, in the time that I have remaining, I'll figure out whether I'll punish each and every one of y'all here or whether I'll reward each, of anyone, each, each and every one. Because of your silence on those issues, because of your silence, that is why I chose to come to Canada. I heard nothing. And in my country, no news is good news. You said nothing. So I'll decide whether I'll punish you or whether I'll reward you. So think about it, right? Um, and so on and so on. Deny the right to participate in the family. Deny, deny, deny. Where is my PowerPoint? You're super fast. You work it by electricity? Or <laughs> you're real? You can sit down, yeah? You're, are you a real migrant worker? No, sit down, sit down, Joseph. No, sit down right there. Sit down right there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about exploitation. Again, I want you to read about exploitation, the very definition of exploitation. Here, here are a few of the things, right? Being tied, being tied to the employer, being tied to your employer. What are some of the issues that migrant workers face? Let me see number one, restriction. Let me tell you, let me put it this way. Being a migrant farm worker, not only is my employer my employer, my employer controls my housing. He, my employer is my landlord. My employer, they control the travel agency that's booking our flight in and out of Canada. My employer is my travel agent. Every aspect of my life is being controlled by the employer. That is the very definition of vulnerability. Now, if I'm tied to my employer, my employer can kick me. My employer can kiss me. That is the definition of vulnerability. And so many obstacles that my wage theft. Can you imagine the amount of issues? I'm tied to the employer, tied to the employer. And what happened to? Not only am I tied to the employer, do I live in the city? No, we live on the farm. We are property of the farmers. We are property of the farmers. Every aspect of our lives are controlled. And where is that happening? In a free country. And remember Canada? On the world stage, Canada is a champion for human rights. Canada, people look up to Canada, but your silence on those issues, is it doing a good thing? Is it helping the victor? Or is it helping the victim, your silence on those issues? Where is my PowerPoint? Um, yeah, let me just use that. I'm sorry, hold it for me. I, um, I want, to, I want you to, um, again, as I said, I can only give you the skeleton, and I want you to do additional reading. For example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Are you aware of that? What is one of them? No poverty. Did I hear that? Did you hear that? No poverty. Did you hear that? No poverty. But yet still, yet still, migrant workers are being paid. What wage they are being paid? Minimum, the lowest, eh? minimum, Mi you know what's minimum? The very low of the lowest. And on top of it, on top of it, migrant workers, because it's a legal program, all the legal deductions are, are taken from minimum wage, including EI, and they cannot access, the government will knowingly know that they cannot access it, yet still, it's literally everybody is milking the migrant workers. And when the UN says no poverty and zero hunger and all of that, you can see how our system is perpetuated. Are you willing to take on the challenge to look at the most vulnerable in our society? Just now, uh, kindly hold it up for me. Yeah. Um, 
I use the word excluded. Listen to that. Eh? I just said a while ago that the laws that are designed to protect workers in Canada, migrant workers are excluded, excluded, excluded. Listen to that. Minimum wage. What did I say? Can, can you hold it from that? Minimum. You, you remember what minimum is? We excluded from that in Ontario. Overtime pay. Overtime pay. Migrant workers are excluded, excluded, excluded. And the only thing that we, we're entitled to is occupational health and safety. What does that mean? Occupational health and safety. safety. On paper, on paper, we can refuse unsafe work. We can refuse unsafe work. But somebody who's so vulnerable, in truth and in fact, is that practical? Do you understand? If you understand the word vulnerability, your whole life will change and your perspective at work will change. Where is my PowerPoint? <laughs> I do not have much to say about that other than I touched it already. Because it's a legal program, migrant workers are paying all, all the normal legal deductions. Um, F, CPP, EI, all the uh, housing and, uh, and so on. They pay all those and it is from minimum wage. So at the end of the day, are migrant workers really and truly being paid minimum wage or mini, mini, minimum? My PowerPoint is so fast now. <laughs> Let me say a few things about housing. A lot of the times, the houses that migrant workers are living in, you see how comfortable we are here? It's not regulated. Who are the, who are the people in charge of housing? Is it the federal, the provincial, or the local government? And let me tell you two things here. I was counting injustices and I stopped at 20. 20 injustices that migrant farm workers are facing and they're at every, every, every level of government. Every level of government. And housing is at the municipal level. And let me tell you another thing about Canada. Canada is a country of standards, country of standards. When it comes to housing for migrant workers, you know what the government paper says? Provide, um, the employer must provide adequate housing. The word adequate, is that the word of standard? Adequate housing. Where is my power? Just, yeah, let me take this one here. Eh? Um, I've, I've tried to explain exploitation, exploitation. To be tied to your employer, to be denied so much, excluded from so much. A lot of us are ignorant. We live on, um, on the farm. Language is a barrier. So we are... That's the recipe for exploitation. A lot of the workers are Spanish speaking. If you take a Jamaican, he speaks English. Give him a piece of paper, he can't read because Jamaican patwa is, is another recipe for exploitation. Just now, hold on. Let me see. Okay, I've touched that. And in terms of time, let me run. For professional development, I'm going to touch two, a couple of other things. I'm going to talk to you from the standpoint of today, the, the, the purpose of this, this conference. Do you, believe, do you believe that we have, Canada has sufficient resources? Do you believe that or you don't? For example, I'm going to breathe in right now all the air that I want. Are you worried? No, because there's sufficient, not sufficient, there's more than enough for everybody. Even though I take all the air that I need. There's more than enough for everybody. Canada. Canada. They said three quarters of the world is covered by water. And they said Canada. Where is Canada? Where is Canada? Canada controls maybe 50 to 75% of the world's supply of fresh water. 50 to 75%. Do you know how many communities that are on the boiled water advisory. There's one, they said 28 consecutive years in the land of so much. Is that, is that real? In a country that has an abundance of it, there's so many that are denied that basic thing. You now, as, a, as, a, as an organization, you as a worker serving the clients, do you believe that we are all equal? 
Or do you believe that they're first class, second class, and no class? What do you believe? That is where professional development comes in. What is your mindset? How are you going to serve those clients? Uh, do you believe that there's enough for everybody? Do you believe that they should be first class, second class, or we are all equal? Um, other questions would be, do you believe are you progressive or are you conservative? What does that mean? Do you believe that you've had your best days and you need to be careful? Or do you believe that tomorrow can be better than today? What do you believe? That is your mindset. How are you going to approach your work? My PowerPoint is so fast. Um, at the end of the day, I want to ask you, are you concerned? Are you concerned? Are you awake? Are you awake or are you sleeping? If you're awake, you would focus on others and how, my, how am I contributing to a better society. If you're asleep, you focus on yourself and that's it. Um, so you're concerned, are you selfish or are you selfless? That is the question. How professional development, how are you going to take that next step tomorrow at your workplace? Now, in summarizing, my PowerPoint is so fast now, I can't even keep up. Remember I told you, DDT, DDT. What did Canada say? I cannot deny Europeans freedom. I cannot deny them rights. I cannot tie them to a farm. What did Canada say to workers? D-E-T. Migrant workers are denied, they're excluded, and they're tied. But let me tell you, that is why there's that big, huge campaign for status. What does status mean to a worker, to a migrant worker? If I have status, the av to the average Canadian, you know what they, they believe? When you have status, you can live in Canada. Yes, that's right. But to a, a migrant worker, you know what it means? It means that thing that will help me to refuse on safe work. I can choose my employer. It means that thing that will help me to be united with my family. Status means it is that thing that will help me to be treated with some element of respect. That's what status means. So would you, res would you fight? Would you help the most vulnerable? That is the best tool. Listen to that. DET, denied, excluded, and tied. That's the best gift the government can give to an employer. To deny people, exclude them, and tie them to the. That's the best gift the government can. The, that's the, one of the best gifts you can give to a migrant worker status. The other best gift you can give a migrant worker in your service is dignity. I want you to read, I can never overemphasize dignity. And a couple of the two last things because of time, I need to cross in front of you and take some papers here. Yeah? No, just that. And as far as I know, there'll be lots of time for Q&A because there's no way I could tell you everything. A couple of things there. Huh? Before I came to Canada, and that's why a lot of people still come to Canada, migrant workers, the loud, loudest, listen to that, the loudest noise in my head was your silence. Because of your silence, that was the out. That is what made, made me choose Canada. Because no news is good news. Another thing I want to tell you, the most common language in Canada, the most common language in Canada is not English. It's not French. It's not Spanish. The most common language and the loudest language in Canada is silence. And that's the language of the poor and the marginalized. Today, I want to challenge you, going forward, to shift your mindset. Are you seeing your clients as clients, or do you see them as your loved ones? Do you see them as, are you inclusive? I'm going to treat them with dignity and in, make it an, an inclusive environment. I want to challenge you on that. Okasi said, on a banner, is it here? Okasi said, they want you or us to turn I am here to what? I am home. I belong. Think about it. Let me repeat that again. They would like, they would like to challenge you, professional development, right? To change, migrant workers are here. Huh? But to change it to I belong. Think about that. That is professional development. I am here is different to I belong. What, what kind of environment 
do you create at your workplace and what uh, even in your office uh, what attitude right is it belonging inclusive and the last thing i'm going to say for now and i'm going to use another hat i was talking to you as an activist i'm going to talk to you as an author are you all ready for that The last couple of things is about being an author. It is said the Farm Worker Program it started in 1966 in Jamaica. This year it's 57 years. It is said that in 57 years, that's the first time a migrant worker is publishing his or her story. So that's the bright side. The other, the flip side to it. Silence, no news in Canada, silence, no news in Canada. Is it because of good conditions or is it because of suppressive conditions? No news, 57 years. Is it because of great conditions or is it because of very suppressive and vulnerable conditions? What is your position? I want to tell you, I wrote these books for 101 reasons. But to summarize it, let me tell you the three main reasons why I wrote this book. One, I wrote this book because I believe in and I want a Canadian food system that is healthy, that is sustainable, and that is just. That's what I want. Is that what you want? I don't know. I wrote this book to bring hope and to bring freedom. I, I, I want to bring hope to the many, many migrant workers who are vulnerable, and who are tied. I want to bring freedom even to myself because I carry three legs. I carry three legs, one leg from slavery, one leg from indentured labor, and another leg as a migrant worker ex exploitative labor. When, so my mother, so my father, so the son, when will that stop in my family? So I wrote that book to bring freedom, to cut exploitation in my family. Another reason why I wrote that book is E, 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 all the E's you can feel called, to educate people, to empower people, to embolden people, to expose issues, all the E's you can think of. Because what happened? Listen to three things. Canada is a country with a culture of silence. Nobody says nothing. That is one reason why I wrote that book, to break the silence. Are you willing to break the silence? Another reason why I wrote that book is migrant workers are made invisible. We are made invisible. You don't see us. So to bring visibility to people who are made invisible. Another reason why I wrote that book, another reason why I wrote that book, the five Ds of Canada. Have you learned the five Ds of Canada? Have you learned the five Ds of Canada? Canadians, have, they have a PhD in that. I deny it. Denying. PhD. Another PhD, downplaying it. It's worse than the US. Another PhD, derail the conversation. Another PhD, deflect the conversation. Another PhD, delay the conversation. They never want to face it. Put it under the carpet. We'll talk about that another day. Um, I don't know if I have much time because I can say so much more. But as I said, um, let me see if I can repeat that. I hope I've just given you the skeleton. And I would, I, I would like to encourage you, implore you, beg you, persuade you, maybe pay you to read a little bit more to put the piece together. Because I can never tell you the whole story. There's so much. To it. But at the end of the day, VD, vulnerable people in our midst, are we willing to treat them with dignity and create a better world? Um, how am I doing it? You're doing fine, but you have so much to say, Gabrielle. I'm wondering if there are questions from the floor. Um, if, if, and if there are, please line up at the two microphones. Beautiful. Let's have a conversation about this. Everybody's quiet, so that means they want me to talk. <laughs> even, even my... I like using props. The f I'm waiting on questions, so whilst I'm waiting, 
I'm going to talk. Um, only in Canada, I've seen a tree with a telephone. Have you ever said that? Only in Canada, I've said that. And the program that brought me to Canada is like a tree, and it has a telephone. Um, this number here, this number here, this first number here, 57, it represents the program that brought me to Canada. This year, it's 57 years. It's like a tree. Does that look like a tree to you? I don't even know. <laughs> but it is 57 years. The program that brought me to Canada, the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, this year, it's 57 years. Um, uh, this number three here in that telephone represents the three simple parts of the tree, the stem, the branches, the leaves. The stem, I, we are here in Canada to do jobs Canadians do not want to do. What are the jobs? The jobs, the dirty work. Difficult, dangerous, and uh, deadly. Every year, an average of two workers are dying. That tells you how dangerous, difficult it is. If workers are dying, can you imagine how many more are getting injured? So that's the, the stem. We are here to do jobs Canadians do not want to do. What are the branches? We, um, we, do, we, do, we have a tied work permit. What does that mean? We are tied to our employer. And the, the, the leaves, we are denied, denied, denied. So let me go over that. To be tied to an employer, to do the dirty work and denied and excluded from so much, that is the program. That is the food that you're eating. Um, because of that, I've said 20. There are 20 injustices. Because of time, I can't go through all of them. 20 injustices. But the bottom line is they're at every, every, every level of government. And the five... What are at the root of those problems? What is at the root of those problems? Our silence. What is at the root of those problems? Our silence. Our ignorance. Uh, th there's so many things at the root of, of, of our problem. But I have a question. Let me hear you. Yes. Um, Janet Madume, Well and Heritage Council and Multicultural Center. And one of our programs that we provide is the Migrant Worker Program. So we have an ESL uh, that we run. And Gabrielle, congratulations on, our, on your book. I think I attended one of those sessions uh, online. So congratulations. Uh, really, my question is around, we've seen a lot of migrant workers um, go through exploitation in terms of they cannot complain about even their living conditions or their, how they're treated at work. Uh, by the time we find out about these situations and trying to find help through legal aid, they've already exited because they've been uh, sent back by that same employer. So what are some of the things you can bring to the table or we could leverage uh, to assist these individuals before that happens to them? Uh, thank you for this nice, interesting question. Um, how much time do you, would you give me to answer that question? Because there are lots of things I can say. Um, the federal government has set aside millions of dollars to educate and empower workers about their rights. Presently, the TNO, the neighborhood organization, they receive funding to work with migrant workers across the province. Is that, based on what I've said, is that good money? Is that a good project? Is that an essential project? Is that an important project? Is it? We know migrant workers the reality is they live on the farm, they are isolated, they, they're not among us. How many migrant workers are there? Because of their pre vulnerable situation, we cannot even bring them here. We're talking about them, but yet still, they, we cannot bring them here because of their vulnerability. So that, that tells you that um, there's need to educate and empower those workers. There's need to educate and empower those workers. So the TNO, because the province is so big, the TNO has Partner, partners working um, at different places in, across the province, helping us to connect. But I would like to encourage you, I would like to beg you, I would like to persuade you, and I'll even pay you to take my card, take my, get my other colleagues, because we, we want to share the information with each and every migrant worker who comes to Canada, regardless of language. We want to reach each and every worker. Remember, they're vulnerable, they're in difficult situations, but make sure you take my card, make sure you get to know my colleagues, make sure you get to know who TNO is and who are the partners are, because we want to, we want to leave no stone unturned. These are two vulnerable people, and not only are they vulnerable, who is a migrant worker? Migrant worker essentially is your food, food security. Without them, you have no food. Without migrant, we have no food. What is life without food? Food is a basic thing, right? So protecting a migrant worker essentially is protecting your food. 
So make sure you connect us to each and every migrant worker. Look at that. P, 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 P. What are the people planting, picking, processing, packaging? Even in the restaurants, they prepare your... What are the people? It's always people of color. Don't you want to protect those people? Please connect us. Please connect us. In a nutshell, we are here to try to empower. But remember, migrant workers have few rights, but we are here to, to let them know of it anyway. Even though in practice it might be difficult from today, but we are here to provide help. In addition, I want to expand a little on that. In addition, the, prov the services that we provide, it is free, free, free. The mi your tax money, millions of dollars, it provides those services to workers free. Things like little support with immigration issues, um, CPP, um, um, the child tax, what's it called? Baby benefits or, or whatever, parental benefit, whatever it's called. You know, little things that will help them to navigate it. And we provide those services that are free, but as much as possible, not only is it free, we try to provide it, provide it with dignity to some element of respect and welcoming. I hope I've answered your question, but you mean there's only one question in this room, eh? I was just going to say that. <laughs> Please join them. I'm, I'm here because that, those uh, lights are blinding. Okay. Um, yeah, they're very uh, Here's bright. another blinding thing. I have a lot of things to tell you. You see, the truth is, <laughs> the truth is, that's how it's presented to us, right? I went across Canada buying, I tried to buy the nicest bag for you. That's what I came up with. And that's how it's presented to you. What is presented to you? Buy local. Buy local. When you go to the, you see how nice this thing is? Buy local. And I like local too. I like local. What is local? Freshness. Support the local economy. Good health. But let me open that bag. Let's open that bag. When you buy local, let me go to the garden and get something local. <laughs> when we buy local, you know what Canada is telling you? That we want black people, brown people, people of color. When you buy local, Canada is telling you we want people of color, and especially if those people, they struggle with English. English is a second language. So even better yet, those people of color, they struggle with English, even better if they're ignorant about labor issues and employment issues. Let me go over that again. Canada is saying, send me people of color. They struggle with English so I can exploit them easily, I can play with them, and even better if they don't know anything about labor issues, human rights issues. And hear that. Canada said, come, 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 you're welcome here. But you're welcome in a climate of fear. There's a lot of fear, and I can spend the whole afternoon talking about fear. One element of fear, let me, let me say a few elements. To live on the farm, on the farmer's property, on the farmer's property, you see, at the entrance of the farm, you know what it says? Private property, no trespassing. That's one element of fear. The employer, they control the travel agency. That's another. The moment you speak up, you're on the next flight. That's another. So we're welcome in a climate of fear, and we are forced to become submissive and compliant. And where is that happening? In a country with a culture of silence. And is that an illegal or legal program? It's, it has the full blessing of government. What are you going to do with it? I want you to look at your hands today, go into your workplace tomorrow, I want, or go into your home tonight, I want you to look at your hands. There's power in your hands as a voter, as a consumer, as a service provider, there's power in your hands. How are you going to use that power? I have a question here and a question here. Yeah, we're going yes. to go to over here. Yes. Beautiful, thank you. Hi, Gabriel. Um, my name is Hassan. I'm the Executive Director of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. And um, I love Gabriel. Thank you so much for all of your amazing words. I have just a really basic question. So, for example, say if the Minister of Immigration were to walk into this room, what is one thing you think everyone should tell him about migration and the migrant worker program? Say the Minister of Immigration walked into this room, what should we all tell him to do for migrant justice? Um, it's very simple. Canada continues to keep unjust immigration policies to keep people vulnerable and exploited. What is the solution? I think I told you the solution. Where did I put the solution? How did the, my PowerPoint put my solution? Eh? That is for all. And what did, what? <laughs> Let me remind you, status is a two-edged sword. It takes care of our immigration vulnerability. It takes care of our labor vulnerabilities. So 
um, in my home country, when we have a lot of pain, we take Panadol, Tylenol. In Canada, what do you take? Advil, Tylenol. Mm -hmm. This is our painkiller. This is migrant workers' painkiller. It takes care of a lot of our pain. It can never cure racism, for sure, but it takes care of a lot of our pain. Status. Are you going to join the fight and push the point? You know what the politicians are saying? That's not an issue in my riding. That's not an issue. Remember what I told you? The more disconnected we are from our food, we are not concerned. We are not concerned. But your food security is, is at risk if these people are not um, taken care of. And you have the power to push the politicians. Because the unjust, we are not saying Canadians are bad. We are not saying the politicians are bad. We are not saying the consumers are bad. What we are saying, the policies are, Good. are bad. And we can change them by pushing the politician. My friend. Hi. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mahta. I work for Ocasi's PSI project. Thank you so much for this, uh, for this talk. Um, I find so valuable what you said about the importance of education, educating people about their rights um, and, you know, programs we have in place to do that. Um, I'm wondering also about, you know, beyond personal education and, you know, workers knowing their rights, the power that comes in collectivity, in, in creating associations. I mean, we're all here because of the, the power we have in, in coming together, bringing organizations together. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to some of the alliances of, of migrant workers and the movements that exist in Canada um, and ones that we can support as workers who, don't, who aren't you know, migrant workers or who don't even necessarily work directly with migrant workers. Good question. Thank you for this nice question. Can you take my card to join my club? Yeah, um, across Canada, one thing, there are lots of groups and organizations across Canada that are there fighting with, fighting for migrant workers, lots of groups, right? In each province, there will be different groups. I'm not too sure, are, we all, are they all from Ontario? Um, yes. Okay, Ontario, there are lots of groups in Ontario. And um, a, a tactics, a technique that the government uses is to pit one against the other, to pit one against the other. And I want you to be careful of that, to pit one against the other. At the end of the day, injustice is injustice. That is what is uni unifying or unites all the groups, right? We, we are fighting injustice. But the government tried to use techniques to, to pit one against the other. How can you know about um, which groups are available? Um, there are lots of groups, I don't know um, in your area, but um, for example, I, um, as you heard in my introduction, or uh, when I was being introduced, um, activists in residence at University of Guelph, I try to bring researchers and activists together. There are lots of different activist groups, lots. Um, there are people, Hassan is a good contact person. I am one, I'm not too sure. There are lots of others. And um, uh, just get in touch with me, get in touch with Hassan. I'm not too sure if I've recognized others, eh? but there are lots of people fighting with and for migrant workers. At, at the end of the day, we are fighting injustice. But the government always tries to use techniques to put one against the other, because the more we fight among ourselves, the issue remains the same. Did I answer that? Where are the questions? Where are the questions? We have time for one more question. Yes, my colleague. Tell us who you are and... Hi, uh, my name is Linda Tanous. I'm with Adult Language and Learning in Chatham. Uh, so I've lived in Chatham, I've been in the sector for about 13 years, but prior to that, so I've lived in Chatham, Kent, oh, well, Leamington uh, for quite a while. And prior to the working in this sector, I never even knew what migrant workers were. And I'm surrounded by greenhouses, like farms, and yet I never knew. So education is key. And so my question would be, and we just very recently received uh, funding for a pilot project for the um, Migrant Worker Program. So we're really trying to work with that. But we're, my question is, we're having a hard time. I, I'm not in that program, but my colleagues are. And they have shared that it's very difficult to get into the farms because they're trying to reach the vulnerable, reach the migrant workers so they can educate them, give them their rights. But the farmer, the employers, of course, they don't want us there. And so we reach out at grocery stores, um, other community centers. And so how do we get some of the employers to trust us to, I don't know, it's just, it's, yeah. But anyways, thank you so much for your presentation. It was excellent. 
and I'm like looking back now, like 15 years ago, like I'm ashamed that I didn't know. But again, it's education. We need education. So it would be, I would love for you to be able to speak at every community, like a municipality, at the mayor's office, and present what you presented today. Thank you for all those kind words. You make me feel like I can go home now. But a couple of things. I personally, personally, I wish I could go to every home in Canada. But because Canada, there's 36 or 40 million people, it's so difficult. That's why I wrote this, so I could get to the homes of everybody. There are also documentaries, lots of documentaries that try to educate people. Yeah. And uh, the vulnerability of workers, that's what you highlighted. To get the farmers on board. There's a guy I met in Hamilton before COVID. He told me he'd been going up and down, um, what's it called, Parliament Hill? And he said in his three years up and down, when he, when he got here, there were 75 lobbyists. And in his three years, there are 375 lobbyists. Uh, my point is that the employers, the, the farmers, they have a lot of power, money, power, influence. They, 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 they lobby. And even, even a lot of ads. They run in, because of this book and, and the fight we have, they run a lot of ads to, to... There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of, you know, to, 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 to brainwash people, whitewash people, right? There, there are lots of stuff. And it's the money, the people with the money, the power, and the influence. The question is, a migrant worker is a vulnerable person. If I'm a vulnerable person, who would I trust? Who would I trust? You see, the word trust, it takes a lifetime to build it. And going to the supermarket area, that's something I do myself. But not for one day, not for one month. You have to do it consistently, consistently, consistently. Because a one-day effort and you disappear is not trust, right? So you have to, be, you have to keep hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. And that is why, that is why I would, I would like to encourage each and everybody to try to connect us with workers because, um, because they're vulnerable. They, they, some workers, they've been here for 20, 20 odd years. They've never been to a home of a Canadian. Are we welcoming? Are we diverse? Are we inclusive? Are we the most multicultural country in the world? Tell me. Professional development. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Gabrielle. Gabriel, I think that we have to commit as OCASI to doing at least one webinar with you in the next few weeks so that our colleagues who weren't here in person and online today can really hear you. Um, you don't know how much you have shared and, and, and how much you have raised um, our education and knowledge about the plight of migrant workers. Thank you. I think you've, you've um, converted quite a few people here today that they have a commitment to join the fight for status for all. Um, thank you. Thank you once again. We have a slight change in our program. Yeah. I beg the indulgence of our uh, panelists. I'm asking you to switch places with the Minister of Immigration. Um, he won't be very long, um, and he will be here in about five minutes. So I'm going to ask you to stand and stretch, um, run to the bathroom if you need to, um, and we will be back for my colleagues online. Um, we will be back in five minutes. Thank you, Gabriel.
colleagues. Um, for those of you wanting to buy the book, Harvesting Freedom, Gabrielle Aladois, we have three copies of the books for purchase. Please come to the front table if you want to purchase the book. How much is it? $25 each, a great read. Um, also, can folks start coming back in, please? Our minister is here, and I know he is on a tight schedule. Where did the minister go? <laughs> oh. <laughs> What's this writing? How do you say you're writing and writing? No one can say. No one knows that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Colleagues, let's start taking our seat, please. I, lo I love the fact that we do so much networking in this space. And please be mindful as you're walking across. Um, you, we are, every time you cross by, you interrupt the conversation that's happening um, with our ASL speaking people. Let's grab a seat, please. It is my great pleasure to introduce to all of us his first time speaking at Okasi, our new immigration minister, Minister of Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship, and MP for downtown Montreal, Mark Miller. Welcome, Minister Miller. Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I heard the prior panel, they were looking for me. They had like a question. You could, <laughs> if you had the minister here. We, we were actually outside like hiding. <laughs> so we would avoid the question. But uh, someone can ask it later if they want, because I think it, 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 it sounded like it was an important one. Um, let, me, let me first start by recognizing uh, the territory we're on, the, the traditional territory uh, of, of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, um, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. Now, obviously, the, hope, the home to many diverse First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis. I, I want to congratulate you for, for 45 years uh, where you've had a voice in the settlement sector um, with fewer funds than today. Uh, and your fierce advocacy for eliminating barriers for immigrants and refugees and people looking for a new hope in Canada and finding it here. This conference and the meeting we have today will be an opportunity to continue to foster your new ideas, uh, work and continue your resistance and renewal, um, but also as an op opportunity for me to meet you and, 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 and hear directly from you the work you're doing already uh, I am able to convey what you tell me. These aren't sort of uh, just photo ops. Uh, glad to take pictures, but I get a lot of really, really good feedback from you, and it's stuff that I can actually take back, uh, sometimes even around the cabinet table, uh, but also in particular with the, my department when, um, when they came up, come up with, up with ideas, and it doesn't necessarily mesh with what we're hearing on the ground. Often it does because I have a really good team. I do trust them. Uh, but you are playing a very important role when, you, when we have the chance to chat together and you have the chance to advocate. Obviously, our minds don't always meet, but we have, we have the opportunity in the forum to do it. And uh, what I want to say is, if you get anything from this speech, is that uh, your, 
your advocacy and what you're doing counts. Uh, you're doing stuff that we can't do, nor should we be doing. Uh, and so I'm really glad that uh, the work's being done. Au cours de la semaine prochaine, je ferai un, un nombre d'annonces, un certain nombre d'annonces, notamment le plan, le plan annuel sur les niveaux d'immigration qui sera déposé, présenté au Parlement d'ici le 1er novembre, donc dans la première moitié de la semaine prochaine. J'apprécie le travail acharné et votre contribution de toutes les organisations à notre système d'immigration, ainsi que la manière dont nous pouvons, nous nous devons de mieux planifier et nous adapter à l'avenir. Si j'ai retenu une chose dans mes deux mois et demi, trois mois et quelques euh, miettes comme ministre de l'Immigration, c'est qu'il faut vraiment mieux planifier. Uh, over the past year, we've uh, valued the feedback you've given us on a number of things, um, but particularly as we prepare the la the, to launch the calls for proposals for the Settlement and Resettlement Assistance Program uh, before the end of November. We've heard that building and welcoming communities uh, requires a collaborative effort with community groups, uh, different levels of government, your organizations and, and companies all working together. And I get that we, we sometimes trip over each other. Uh, but again, what I've heard, this is what I've heard, and I said it in French, what I've heard in the last three months and change that I've been the minister, is that coordination is crucial uh, for everything from reducing wait times to making sure people have the proper experience that Canadians expect them to have when they get here. Um, based on your feedback, we are continuing to modernize our services and looking to leverage uh, hybrid and digital service delivery to offer smaller and rural areas the same level of support that large cities receive. Um, we do know and acknowledge the, the, the outstanding needs of large cities at the same time. We will continue to improve the services, in particular for francophone minority languages communities with the Paris Pour services for francophones. Um, for francophones, by francophones. Uh, this is a key aspect uh, of the federal government's jurisdiction that has often been criticized for not being utilized enough. And it goes to our credibility as a government, um, especially in our role as a bilingual country. Um, we're making changes within IRCC as well to ensure that we can contribute to support your work, as well as the needs, uh, and particularly the needs of refugees and displaced persons. For instance, we're creating a team to monitor international affairs so we can see issues as they emerge and be better prepared to respond quickly and diligently. And sadly, this is a skill set that we are now deploying in real time with a real humanitarian tragedy happening uh, in Israel and Gaza. Ces changements visant à vous soutenir et à améliorer le système d'immigration sont extrêmement importants. L'immigration et le travail que vous faites pour la soutenir est plus important que jamais. Notre population vieillit, vous le savez bien. Le nombre de travailleurs qui soutiennent des programmes vitaux tels que les pensions, les systèmes sociaux, les soins de santé, l'éducation est passé d'environ 7 pour 1 euh, quand j'étais petit à près de 3 pour 1 au cours des 50 dernières, 50 dernières années. We do need talented newcomers for our own survival to address labor shortages and drive economic growth in order to support these critical programs in the future and to support what Canadians expect us. Um, in the last few years, OCASI members have shown Canadians in the world that it's possible to have a good humanitarian system and help newcomers integrate with support services in a way that ultimately benefits us all. Refugees are also highly skilled workers in tech, nursing, trades, and other fields in an area that we haven't tapped into as well. Uh, that skill set is there and it's something that we have to do a better job in coordinating. I do note, and I know a lot of you since you are on the front line, front lines have noted perhaps a wind of change in Canada about how immigrants, whether uh, it's people that come here uh, in economic classes, parents, uh, grandparents, refugees, asylum seekers, uh, there's been a short a, a turn in the wind. And I think that is something that is immensely scary something that uh, we all need to fight against and perhaps, uh, I guess, not take as granted as much the, uh, the consensus that has been built over um, immigration generally in a country like Canada. It's something I think we all need to fight against because I think we still need to step up for immigrants and refugees as they are f the first people to feel uh, that pain and blame for things that aren't their fault. Uh, the housing crunch has never been the fault of refugees and asylum seekers or immigrants. And in fact, um, 
we wouldn't have a number of the houses we have today without that skill set. So looking at and really raising up the, the value of people as they help continue to build this country um, is really something that we have a job as the federal government to enhance. Um, but it also, um, through the work that you're shining on, is something that we will have to continue to, uh, to focus on the next little while. Uh, I believe in us. I believe in Canada. I believe our, in our ability to do it. Um, and this isn't sort of a dire warning, but what we are seeing often uh, in some of the criticism is our own failure to coordinate, uh, our own failure internally to the federal government, but across government levels, whether it was with the provincial government, cities, organizations, and the whole concept of tripping over each other actually fuels that, that narrative at times. So this is something we can work on, and, and I certainly think we can do so as a country. Uh, when I talk to my international partners, um, what we're doing is the envy of the world. It's still worth, uh, it's still worth pursuing and lifting up. Um, We are working to ensure uh, that Canada and you can continue to be world leaders, as I alluded to earlier, in welcoming newcomers, ensuring they have resources that they need to succeed. And with your feedback, we're working to better align our programs and services with the needs of employers and communities and better reflect the capacity to support services and how, particularly in housing. Notre équipe continuera à vous écouter, à travailler avec vous pour obtenir des résultats en faveur de nos communautés, de notre économie et de ceux qui ont besoin de notre aide, de votre aide, et votre travail parle de lui-même. In the last 10 years, you've been there for some of the world's most vulnerable people, whether it's helping Yazidis, uh, the 80,000 Syrians that are welcomed here to flee war in the Middle East, helping Afghans following the return, the, the return of the Taliban in Afghanistan. I'd note on that end that uh, we're approaching very, very closely uh, the 40,000 target that we have set. Um, this will not be a hard and fast target. Uh, there's some folks left behind, and we have to work to make sure that they are not left behind. Obviously, the situation in Pakistan is extremely alarming, but we continue to work to bring more people in, those people that we've made a commitment to. Um, or welcoming Ukrainians to Canada in the face of a nuclear aggressor uh, because of the illegal Russian invasion. Or just generally the work that you're doing that I've spoken to a number of you about, helping asylum seekers in the waves of uh, that we are seeing in an increasingly uncertain world that has gone over the 100 million mark of displaced people. Canada is not immune to this, uh, and there's no simple solution to making sure that this works properly. But we'll continue to work, and we'll need you for that. Our shared values of equality and diversity and inclusion are reflected in what you do. Um, as we build areas in specific needs, such as anti-racism, uh, 2SLGBTQI plus awareness, and, and mental health, promotion. With you, what you do is difficult, and I acknowledge that, uh, particularly with strained resources, and it does take considerable heart and dedication. The impact you and your teams that have done will help generations shape lives um, as those who arrive uh, as children become the leaders of tomorrow, thanks to you. Je remercie, and thank you. Yeah, please go to the microphone. Um, if you have questions for the minister, we'll take a few questions. Line up at either one of the microphones, please. Share your name um, and your organization and your question. Please be brief. Hello, hi, my name is Esel Panlaki. I'm with TNO, the neighborhood organization. We're based in Toronto. So my question is, uh, we're learning that IRCC's Evaluation and Performance Measurement Division is currently conducting an evaluation of the caregiver pathways. That's very great, and we're happy to participate in that process. And so my question is, would there be opportunity for our clients, uh, the caregivers that we've been serving under the old path, uh, the old caregiver program, and those under the caregiver pathways to participate in the evaluation process, and how we can support that, that, that process? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take two questions at a time and then go to the minister. Microphone number two. Hi, my name, Hi, my name is Pupe. I'm a settlement worker with Welcome Center. And I'm happy to be part of uh, IRCC, 
helping clients and happy to be there and receiving funds to help newcomers, refugees, and immigrants. Uh, unfortunately, we're spending the fund and time, but sometimes it's very hard for us to reach IRCC because there is not an um, exact way for us to have a contact information like not calling the 2100 line or sending web form for a request when the client is there. We think that we need a specific way to reach us IRCC when we have clients. And the other thing is when we are calling, IRCC doesn't respect us to represent our client. They want uh, to verify the client and some of the clients doesn't know to how to speak English and French. And we are funded by IRCC. We have the capacity to speak in their language, but we cannot speak with the agent. Thank you for that, Minister. Microphone four. It was, I think it was Esset. I hope I got your name. Yep. name. Can you speak to my team after and we can coordinate uh, how you would provide feedback? I think it would be, it would be welcome. Um, so they're right here. Juan is here. Uh, and Scott Harris from the department is also here. So there he is, right behind you. Right behind the you, sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, speak that. we'd be glad to take your feedback on that. Uh, and, and I, I do acknowledge the challenges at time on a client basis to get through to folks. Uh, I've, I've, I've had the, being from downtown Montreal as the MP, I probably has, have before I became the minister and, and now even more, uh, some of the highest volumes in Quebec with obviously people that come through our doors are usually, we're not the instance of first recourse, typically last. Um, so we go through the same procedures as you. So I, I, I acknowledge the frustration because I have my team yelling at me all the time uh, about getting through to IRCC. Uh, we do want to, so we do, we're looking at a number of measures to enhance the, the client experience. I, I do have, uh, I, I, and again, I acknowledge the need um, to get real answers uh, on behalf of your clients. Uh, there, there is also, and I do respect that, the need to ensure people's privacy, just given the level of, of abuse that you're no doubt aware of. Um, so filling out those forms, uh, as frustrating as they are, is, is key for us to be able to know that we're interacting with the right people, even if you're a partner organization, it's, it's the same thing for a member of parliament. Is there a way to streamline that and still safeguard people's uh, privacy interests? Perhaps, and, and obviously op open to ideas if, if you do have them. Uh, even being a partner organization is not, um, it isn't sufficient when it's individual cases that sometimes are highly, highly, highly sensitive and could be the difference between whether someone stays or is, uh, is, is removed or doesn't have, or, or, or stays here without regularization. So I, I, I will acknowledge the frustration though on that end. Thank you. I'm going to take the next three questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Miller, for being here. Uh, my name is Annie Kelly. I'm from the uh, Immigrants Working Center in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, my question or rather a statement is, is kind of related to, you know, what you said regarding um, the, uh, you know, the, the strain that is put on organizations kind of human resources wise, right? We're all, and I think, you know, there's, there's a, a human resources crisis kind of a, across the workforce, but um, it's something we've heard over and over again throughout this conference is we're all very, very stretched uh, resources wise. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, IRCC is looking at um, the wages overall, especially in terms of our positions that, you know, were dominated by uh, women and especially racialized newcomer women. Um, and is that being taken into consideration when looking at, um, you know, the next call for proposals? Is there anything being looked at in terms of uh, wages? Good question. Um, thank you so much and uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister Mira, for being with us today. Um, my question is around the uh, migrants. Who are you? It, let's know who you are, please. Oh, so my name is Kizito Musaiman. I'm the founder, executive director of the Rwandan Canadian Healing Center. We are based in Toronto, and we've been uh, one of the leading organizations in responding to the migrant workers that are left on the streets, mainly downtown at 129 Peter Street. 
Um, we've been having discussions with mainly the city of Toronto, uh, working with groups like Okasi and others. Um, one of our main challenges right now is we are being directed and redirected directly to your office, to the Ministry of Finance federally, and they are telling us that it's your responsibility to respond to the crises on the street. We, um, we've had to find churches, which most people within the shelter system don't like, but we've had to find churches to put people where we have about four plus hundred people, 400 plus people, and we're still waiting for somebody to look at this as a crisis and act urgently as it's required. So my question to you is, are you ready? When are you going to be, because I know you, you're new um, in, in the position. We had pushed the, the effort with your previous um, colleague, uh, the, the former Minister of Immigration. And then, of course, the, that changed. So now we're asking you, are you ready to take action? And is it possible to, de to take it as soon as possible? Because most of these people are getting sick. Um, they are out on the street. These are Africans that are not used to these temperatures. So, because if, if nobody acts, I'm sure that we're going to have worse conditions and are you ready to act to be able to step in and provide the help that we really need we don't have the resources to do the kind of work that we are being asked to do thank you i'm actually going to have the minister answer those two questions and then we'll come back to you sir yeah, thank you thank you amy uh, i know a lot i i think i've said this in in a similar context, but I, I know a lot of you could be doing other things with your lives, and, and, and I know you're putting your own lives on the line for less pay to really make a difference for people. Um, I, think, I think as we're doing the, the review, we do have to be sensitive to your reality, to the reality that we're all facing, um, that inflation and, and, and costs and wages have, have gone up. Uh, we face a, a pressure that I face within my department uh, as well as anyone, the Minister of Finance uh, included, with a tight fiscal environment federally, um, as well as expenditure reviews. So uh, I don't want to dash hope. Uh, I don't want to create false hope. Um, but we are, we are opening to, to funding models that, 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 that need to work for you um, as we try to modernize the system and be, as I mentioned in my speech, more integrated. Uh, but I don't deny that what you're doing, you should be getting a lot more money for. Um, but again, w work with us. Uh, I just do have to, it's not a warning, it's the reality of the fiscal situation we face, we are facing federally, is, uh, is uh, that we have to be very careful with what we are, we are doing um, financially as a government. Um, doesn't mean that we're gonna stop, and that's not the impression I wanna leave with you. Um, but there is that, that, that consideration that we are worrying about. It doesn't, again, doesn't need to be on your backs. And I will, I, I will fight as hard as I can to make sure that uh, your organizations don't get the shorter end of a stick on this. Um, so work with us, because I know the work you're doing, uh, and, that's, uh, and it's crucial. Um, so I, I didn't quite understand what, maybe this was two questions, it was my, what were you talking about? The, you know, Re refugee claimants. On refugee, I thought, was to I thought we were a asking yeah. about migrant workers, uh, <laughs> just because the, um, of, the, of the title that, uh, yeah. that, that you'd mentioned. So, the, I'll say a couple things because I've had a lot of conversations with uh, the mayors in particular, whether it's Mayor Chow, um, Mayor Brown, uh, Mayor Crombie, uh, affected mayors with really the humanitarian situation on the street when it comes to asylum seekers. Uh, this is an unprecedented wave. Um, I think what we're hearing from our partners in, in cities is they want to plan in a better way. And so I, you know, I see a failure of planning here. Uh, you know, shelter is no place for, uh, for an asylum seeker or, you know, a family often. Um, churches for that matter either uh, and it's no place for a press conference for that matter but that's editorial for my part um, you know this is about a humane reaction and response to uh, what is increasingly a, you know a real humanitarian challenges on the streets of uh, well now downtown Toronto I lived through it uh, as a member of parliament with respect to Roxham Road, 
a couple of years ago. Um, but again, uh, this is something that, that you know, we overcame, but when, not without some pain. And, and I think the jurisdictional ping pong that is being played is really, really unfortunate because it's being done on the backs of the people that you serve. Um, and I do not like it when folks try to weaponize this uh, for, their own, uh, for their own reasons. Uh, the federal government has a role to play, uh, and I've asked my department to be quite proactive, whether it's making sure that these people don't get stuck in really long processing times uh, so they get the due process that they're due, <laughs> whether we uh, get work permits into their hands so there's the opportunity to get some uh, to get to, to, to get a salary um, matching people with businesses I some of our senior members are on the phone with 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 big companies that have labor shortages but we can't do this in a coordinated approach uh, unless each jurisdiction is actually effectively deploying its jurisdiction effectively that means in this case the government of Ontario is sitting on billions of dollars um, in the past, it actually did well in some areas, as well as it could. So it, there's a space for it there as well. Um, recently, we've deployed a $200 envelope, $200 million rather envelope, including $97 million for the city of, um, for, of Toronto for interim housing. Um, that's work that's ongoing, uh, but we're not going to stop at that. Uh, there's two sort of time periods here, uh, more longer term, but especially winter. And as you mentioned, um, the streets are cold no matter what your race, color, or creed, uh, and it's no place for someone like that. They, if you don't have mental health issues to begin with, you will develop them. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the reality of, of, of being on the streets. So the faster we can get a roof over people's heads and get them comprehensive services, um, the better. The better for the people that will be an asset to this country. Um, I don't distinguish between people that are on the streets if they're Canadian or not Canadian. Um, <laughs> No one's been serving those people well, regardless of the passports they hold. So I've asked my team to deploy their resources and be a little more proactive. We've done blitzes within the churches to make sure that people had, like I mentioned, work permits um, and, 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 and we could start some of the processing. If people get shifted around, we lose their addresses and they don't get, you know, the lag time between that and the IRB making a decision gets, uh, gets extended. Um, but I think we can do better than that. There are some proposals and, and, and you know, I've called out some people, but we are willing to work with Ontario, we're willing to work with uh, the GTA mayors to make sure that their proposals are getting due consideration by the federal government. Um, and I, again, I don't want to be playing jurisdictional ping pong because, uh, again, uh, whenever that happens, it's the people that you're serving that, that pay. So we're willing to step up. Um, I'm, I'm doing some work right now with Minister Fraser and, and the Minister of Finance in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but again, there's a real short-term goal here, which is making sure people have some f semblance of proper housing before it gets too cold. Thank you, Minister. We are very much aware, oh wow, <laughs> we're very much aware of time. I'm actually, unfortunately, going to have to end at Madeline, um, so, and Sajida, Saj you're included. So these three and this one, I'll take all four questions, please be brief, um, and then Minister, I'm going to also ask you to be brief. <laughs> Hello, Minister Miller. My name is Sarom Rowe. I'm with Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. We're an organization of migrant farm workers, care workers, international students, refugees, and undocumented people. And this morning, I was listening to your uh, press conference where you announced uh, findings of the task force, and we welcomed the steps in the right direction. We were supporting the students who were facing deportation this summer. 18 days, 24 hours, um, and uh, we look forward to details as this program, as the regulatory frameworks are announced. One of the students I chatted with is undocumented, and she was not able to have her case reviewed in the task force, and she was crying on the phone today because she's separated from her young baby. She and half a million other people in this country are undocumented. Every day, 21 months ago, the Prime Minister promised a regularization program, and it's a promise that's been reiterated a number of times. And every day of delay means that more of our members, more migrant and undocumented people in this country are facing exploitation, denial of fundamental rights, and family separation. This regularization is in our hearts. Will you champion 
an uncapped regularization program that grants permanent resident status for all undocumented people and bring it to the fall cabinet meeting so that you, can, that you and your co cabinet colleagues can make a decision and announce a program that will change the lives of half a million, minimally half a million people in this country. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Minister. My name is Shahira Rehman. Um, I'm a settlement counselor working with uh, uh, Agent Co Community Services, AXA. Um, je, vais, je vais poser ma question en français. Uh, je suis francophone et on n'a pas souvent l'occasion de parler français. Uh, la question que je voulais vous poser, c'est concernant les étudiants internationaux. Uh, y a un, un flot d'étudiants qui se présentent à notre euh, agence tous les jours et qui, qui ont nulle part où aller ou vers qui se retourner pour avoir des ressources, de l'aide. Et ils viennent et ils se présentent à notre banque alimentaire. Malheureusement, on ne peut pas les aider vraiment parce que les fonds qui nous sont attribués, c'est seulement pour euh, les résidents permanents euh, ceux qui ont des statuts qui ont déjà été acceptés, les réfugiés qui ont été acceptés. Et donc, euh, ces étudiants internationaux sont un peu abandonnés à eux-mêmes. On a accepté un très grand nombre euh, chaque année, et là, cette année, je pense que ça a battu les records. Et ils se retrouvent aussi dans des situations complètement euh, euh, sanitaires difficiles, parce que ça euh, aussi détériore la situation du logement pour tout le monde. Alors, est-ce que vous allez mettre en place des mesures justement pour adresser ce problème qui devient de plus en plus grave et qui en fait affecte aussi euh, la crise du logement et la disponibilité du logement pour les autres immigrés Merci. Merci. Good afternoon. Um... <laughs> Hi, my name is Sajid Ezeraya and I work with Okazi. I'm asking a question on behalf of an online participant. Her name is Paraisa Rahnama. And uh, her question is, is IRCC planning to expand on the IRCC program eligibility criteria for more clients to be able to access benefits for our services, for example, for refugee claimants and people with work permits? Bonjour, Ministre. Uh, good afternoon, Minister Miller. I'm Madeline. I work at Keys in Kingston. And uh, actually, building on the last two questions, um, most of the folks in this room work in organizations funded by your ministry. And it's a, you know, many of us would consider it a privilege to work with folks on language learning, on employment, on settlement integration, mental health, working with women. And we love the work that we do. But there are people lining up outside our door that we have no ability to serve who are facing the biggest barriers. Undocumented folks, refugee claimants, international students, international graduates, migrant workers, they're all um, in our communities building the future of Canada like you mentioned yourself. So, you know, I'm, my question is, what are IRCC's plans moving forward to expand eligibility for the services that the Government of Canada promotes worldwide as being world-class um, to those who need it. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> the, the last two questions were, were, were very closely related. Um, in part of our review, I think we have to acknowledge the need for you to be flexible. Uh, I can't commit to going beyond what the, 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 the current funding model, which provides for, for, for refugees. Um, it, I know it's frustrating to hear, but I, and again, this is not me telling you who to turn away at the door. That may be the effective result. Um, but it's stuff that I'm committing to review and to have a further look at. Um, yeah, I've just been in this for a couple, a couple months, uh, and, and I've heard this directly from you. Um, but I'm willing to look at it uh, and, and can't commit at this stage to uh, a result, but, but certainly hearing it. And, the, you know, obviously the flow, and I know, you know, a person is a person when they show up, um, but the flow is such that 
I think we need to have, it's fueled my need to have a little more serious conversation with my colleagues in the provinces. Um, and we've talked about welcome centers, we've talked about uh, all sorts of options, um, in particularly with Mayor Chow. Um, but we also have to have a serious conversation about uh, our, our friends in, in, uh, in the provinces doing their jobs. Um, again, this is a fight that shouldn't be on your backs. Um, but I do acknowledge, uh, and I do acknowledge the, the flexibility that we need to sort of show in, in as, we, uh, as we continue to reform and particularly in this new uh, launch for proposals. I just can't commit to go beyond this at this stage. I know it's frustrating to hear, but I don't want to hide that from you either. Je voudrais aussi, puis merci d'avoir posé la question en français. Vous n'êtes pas sans savoir, et si c'est des nouvelles, ça va être des bonnes nouvelles, qu'on regarde plusieurs pistes de solutions pour assurer un passage à la résidence permanente pour les, pour les gens qui viennent ici, qui, puis peut-être des étudiants qui parlent français, pour continuer la vitalité des populations francophones hors Québec. Et on est prêt à travailler avec le Québec aussi pour assurer la pérennité du fait francophone à l'intérieur du Québec. C'est le français, évidemment, dans une, euh, dans une marée, dans une mer d'anglais en Amérique, euh, est, est toujours parsemée de menaces. Et puis les ressources qu'on affecte au fait français doivent être différentes et tisser sur mesure euh, pour, pour appuyer les francophones à travers le pays. Alors, je vous remercie d'avoir posé votre question en français. Euh, mon collègue Sean Fraser, mon, mon prédécesseur, travaille notamment sur les solutions de logement. Encore, je ne veux pas sortir de ma poche l'imputabilité, le, le devoir des provinces de, 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 de travailler pour s'assurer que les gens sont logés, peu importe leur statut. Euh, et sur les logements étudiants, c'est ce sur quoi je me suis penché aujourd'hui en parlant du nouveau système d'institutions reconnues pour s'assurer que les étudiants ici qui, ne, qui ont peut-être été exploités ont été donnés euh, du faux espoir pour venir au Canada pour se trouver démunis ici, euh, soit euh, traité de façon humanitaire, évidemment, mais aussi euh, que cette situation ne se reproduise plus pour les gens qui sont exploités. Puis ça existe, il y a de la fraude dans le système de visa des étudiants internationaux. C'est ce euh, à quoi je m'attaque, euh, mais je n'ai pas la solution complète aujourd'hui. Et ça va prendre encore une fois les, les provinces et une responsabilisation des provinces à ce niveau-là, parce qu'il y, y a des effets très réels quant au logement, la sécurité physique des gens. Euh, mais moi et, et, et le ministre Fraser sont prêts, euh, sommes prêts à, à faire notre travail. Um, so, uh, let's talk a bit about undocumented. There, there's things I can... Uh, Regularization. Regular, what did I say? Undocumented. Undocumented. <laughs> My mind is becoming a bit of a jelly right now, but I, I this is a, this is a, a something that's, that is very personal for me that I, that I want to see happen. Um, there are challenges, and I would say there is resistance uh, at the government as to what path to take. It's the reflection of a number of things, uh, and it's sort of a reflection of a number of competing factors that we got to fight. We got to fight against uh, the window. The cabinet window this fall is very, very uh, limited. Um, and so I, I can't get in, I need to get something in front of my colleagues uh, in order for anything to happen. Um, what I will say is uh, I am hopeful to try to have that with my colleagues, discussion with my colleagues in the winter spring session. What that program looks like is still very much up in the air. And I will share with you a number of competing um, narratives that I think we can fight against, but are, are the reality. Um, one, the impression that people that are here that are undocumented are queue jumpers. Um, therefore, souring uh, a lot of the water for uh, people that are here um, waiting their turn. That is a dangerous narrative. Um, but me calling it dangerous uh, doesn't mean I'm going to ignore that it exists. Um, it colors the analysis that we put to things. It also colors uh, the categories that we may have to consider as being uh, ones that are ready for regularization. 
um, and ones that may not be ready. Obviously, uh, I would look towards something that is broad. Uh, if someone has been here for a long time, has had kids that are Canadian, uh, has worked, and otherwise fine, uh, there is no reason why that person isn't, shouldn't get, they're Canadian anyway, but they're just not Canadian in name or in their passport. So um, I see no logical reason to exclude those people. Um, the challenge, I think, is on the margins, uh, as well as the cost of the program that I think is, is, is worth some discussion. That 500,000 number could well be 600,000, uh, and so we don't know. I'm not a huge fr fan of putting a, a, an artificial cap on things when we don't even have a real sense of what that number is, um, but it is a pathway that's worth exploring. Um, so I'm committed to it, uh, and I don't think anyone should leave this discussion thinking I'm not committed to it. I, I will be pushing my team to make sure that we have something for uh, proper discussion at Cabinet. Um, and I think it's something that we need to be proud of. Um, in the meantime, in the meantime, what I'm also looking at is uh, the, the sectoral ability to regularize some people that are in some of the trades that have fallen out of status. And I think that is sort of a part, that's, it's a partial measure and it doesn't respond to the, the, the question that, that you posed uh, in, in its more general iteration. Um, but we are looking at some solutions for people that are in this country and working um, and have fallen out of status. So uh, we will be ready to take measures in different areas. Um, but again, these are all policies that are in development. Um, but I do think, again, uh, this is something we have to do as a country. It's something that has, I would say, large support around the cabinet table. Um, but again, no one is going to be uh, convinced of what I'm saying until they see it in front of them uh, and see the program um, for themselves. So my commitment is to continue to work on it, and I, it is one of my, uh, it is one of my, uh, my primary priorities. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, we have lots of advocacy work to continue to do with the minister broad immigration program. Glad to hear that, Minister, that you continue to be committed to moving forward um, with a policy. I like the fact that you talked about no, not putting any artificial cap. I think the federal government has a responsibility in educating the public that there is no queue, that anyone is jumping. I don't think that's a good enough reason. <laughs> And um, we've got to address the issues of eligibility of service. Um, as you heard, people are at our doors. Our agencies need to be able to provide and are providing services. They're just not being recognized for the services that they are providing. We're very pleased that in Ontario we have um, services based on needs, not immigration status, but the money isn't enough. So we agree that there's some work for us to do with the provincial government as well. Our colleagues are from the bureaucracy are here, um, as are your colleagues from IRS. RCC, eligibility of service, compensation for the sector, and a, regu a broad regularization program. Three key, key, key priorities for us as a sector. And so very glad to hear that you're on site and willing to work with us on this. Thank you for showing up and for chatting with us today. I'm going to ask our panelists to make their way up to the stage, please. I so appreciate you um, saying yes to um, having your time change. So um, our panelists, please make your way to the stage.
Thank you so much, colleagues. It is always good when the minister hears directly from you and not from the council. Um, sometimes we believe that government looks at us and says, well, you're paid to be advocates. Um, we want to hear directly from the community. And so thank you for stepping up to the microphone and bringing the issues that you're working with daily to the minister. So thank you very much. Give yourself. This is how we build advocacy muscle in the sector, which is a priority for the OCASI board. It is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this afternoon's, our last panel of our two-day conference. It's been a wonderful, wonderful co um, conference. Hassan is the executive director of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change and a member of the Migrant Rights Net Network Secretariat, and he will introduce his panel. Thank you, Debbie. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, in case you were wondering if I had prior knowledge before the question, I did uh, <laughs> uh, when I asked Gabriel that question. Um, this is uh, an exceptional space. Uh, it is an exceptional conversation. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, we're here to talk about change, right? So we understand quite clearly from the conversation that we just had with the minister that he's new. Uh, that he wants to move, but he's, you know, repeating some of the conversations that we need to have again. The notion that migrants are taking up um, spaces or are queue jumpers, etc. So that our work is really cut out for us. And to help us navigate this moment, uh, we have with us three uh, brilliant minds that um, I've had the pleasure of knowing. So uh, to my right is uh, Kazito Musabimana. Musabimana, yes. I recently met Kazito most recently uh, in the incredible advocacy and support that Kazito has done to support uh, refugees who uh, have been shut out of the Toronto shelter system. Uh, he has been coordinating a lot of that incredible support. As he uh, mentioned earlier, he's the executive director of the Rwandan Health uh, Healing Center. Uh, next to, and so, you know, somebody who has a lot of expertise, but most recently involved in a municipal fight. And uh, next to that is Sarom Rose. Sarom is, uh, uh, works at the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, and she's been working a lot on federal immigration issues, including with international students and undocumented people. Uh, and, and next to Sarom is Diana De Silva, who is part of the Health Network for Uninsured Clients, uh, which most recently has been engaged on the question of exclusion from healthcare from, uh, for undocumented people. So we have here people who have expertise, provincial, municipal, and federal. So how we're gonna do this is I'm gonna ask each of them uh, one, que one question that all of them will answer, then I'll ask them one question each, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the floor, have you participate in the conversation, and we'll close with them. So let's get started. Um, this is my question to all three of you, and I, I need you to stick to five minutes, please. Um, which is, can you share just sort of top two or three priority issues for change that you want everyone here to know about? We know there are so many issues, but if, from your perspective, just your top two or three uh, issues of, you know, priority issues that everyone needs to remember uh, when they return to work next week. Please. Uh, thank you so much for, for having us here and, and really appreciate and privileged to be here and to be able to share this um, uh, stage and, and be able to have a conversation with all of you. Um, I would say for me, um, it's, and I, I love what um, Mr. Gabriel shared, um, and I, I, I'm going to take on his cause and I'm really, this is the first time I met him and first time I hear from him, um, but I would say let's not be silent. Whatever you do, whether it's in your position at work, whether it's within your community, find a way to voice the injustices um, that are around us. We all have different causes that we can pick anytime. Um, find a way to communicate that within your work departments and, and find a way to make sure that we don't just do what's on paper. Sometimes, and this is how we are really going, this is how these crises are happening, is because everybody's doing what's on paper and respecting the policies in place, and then people are left unattended to. So that would be one, um, you know, speak up. Um, and two is, I maybe ask you to join me in some of the work that we're doing and, 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 and call your MP, your councillor, mostly MPs though, because I realize that's where the fight is, 
um, make sure to, to reach out and know that your voice counts and call them, whether it's for the issue that you're dealing with in your community, or maybe join us in, in calling for, for the feds to, to take on the fight for the asylum seekers and migrants who need, um, who need to find a place to stay and, and services, wraparound services, which we all in one way or another provide. Thank you, thank you, Mr. So I wanna share a quick story because it's end of day, right? <laughs> um, so a month ago on September 17th, one day before parliament returned from summer break, thousands of people in Toronto hit the streets and called on Prime Minister Trudeau to keep the promise, which we just heard from uh, Minister Miller, um, about creating a regularization program for undocumented people. There were 13 cities across the country that were taking action on the same day. And I was in the one in Toronto and added one of our Migrant Students United members shared his story. He is a former international student and he was going to college in Kitchener. And because he couldn't pay for expensive international tuition fees, which have only gone up during the pandemic and continue to go up, he became undocumented. And he is one of hundreds of thousands of people who are undocumented. He was working at a gas station in the city and his employer was paying him only $10 an hour. I think many people here are from Toronto where you know that $10 an hour doesn't mean anything, especially right now. His employer was telling him that giving, even though he knew, they knew that they had to pay minimum wage, they were paying him $10 an hour because they knew about his immigration status. In fact, they were saying that they were doing him a favor by exploiting him. You and I, we all know this. It is legal to be paid in cash under the Employment Standards Act in Ontario, and no matter what your immigration status is, you have the same rights. The issue, however, is that without permanent resident status, migrants like him are not able to enforce any of the rights that we have. I think Gabriel did such a great job painting all of that out. He soon joined our organization, though, um, and he became a member, and he went from being afraid to even talk about his situation to telling his story in front of thousands of other people, right? And today we supported him to demand the unpaid wages that his employer owes. And when we calculated it, minimally they owe him $40,000. And when he spoke up about his unpaid wages to his employer, they said they threatened him about his immigration status. This is the story of migrant and undocumented people in this country. You probably know this. You know how rampant wage theft is among current and former international students. But because he had the support of others like him, he was connected to other current and former international students and other migrants. He felt the courage to come forward and directly fight for himself and also fight for a larger set of policy changes that would change the lives of so many others. So we, Migrant Students United has a hotline for current and former international students across the country. And I wanna just share the three issues, right, that I'm hearing right now. Right now I'm getting calls from students, and you probably are too, getting calls from students who are asking about their workplace rights, asking about what kind of income supports are available, about where they can go to get food because they are going hungry, about what to do when their landlord is mistreating them and threatening to call the police on them. But there are solutions as long as we come together. So when you go back to work tomorrow or the day after and the next day, you can tell your coworkers to not only refer to our hotline, we have hotlines not only for students, but other migrant farm workers, care workers, um, undocumented people, and we'll share our flyers around. But also let's work together. Invite us to your uh, meetings. Let's jointly collaborate on doing Know Your Rights workshops with students and also make changes because there are some things that you may not be able to say or do, but we can do them together with our organization. And so I'm looking forward to having a conversation about this and I'll pass it to Diana. Wow, so much to think about. I'm just taking it in. I'm here as the co-chair of the Health Network for Uninsured Clients. Um, some of you probably are already members, you know, we're a network of advocates, community service workers, hospital administrators, policymakers, researchers, and we're coming together because we believe in what 
we should all believe in today, equitable access to health care, equal rights, just the bare minimum of what a human should have and what so many of you have today, but also with millions of people who don't have just that basic thing. Um, we've existed for a long time. We have over 200 members, you know, just as many people who are in the room. And it's amazing what we can do together and what we have been doing together. Um, but it's also amazing that just a basic right, right to health, is not a protected right. It's not a protected right in our charter. It's something that Canada has signed on to non-binding international agreements. But again, what we see, what all of you see on a day-to-day -day is that it really is non-binding, this, this right to health. But we have, the, we have the power. We are in a position to make sure it is a right that everyone has. Um, and we, have, we are in a position to change these systems and laws and policies that make it so. Our healthcare system is so complex. I, I don't even have to probably tell you about it. We have a healthcare program that's administered federally, you know, the interim federal health program. We have uh, um, provinces administer our health services. We have these insurance plans. All of them are different from across the province to province. We have private health insurance that cover over only some of our people. And by our people, I mean migrants. I mean the 1.2 million people who are supposed to have access to care but don't. I mean the 500,000 people who are undocumented and don't. I mean the people that we've heard about today, Sarome talking about Dave who's just fighting for his wages. He also is fighting while not having health care, while working every single day not knowing if he will get injured or not knowing if he'll be able to access the doctor the next day. Another story, I want to share another story of another migrant. Her name's Lily Beth, or was Lily Beth. She was a migrant caregiver who came to Canada on a temporary work permit to take care of our families, leaving behind her family. She arrived in Canada and very soon after felt pain. She was rushed to the hospital and she found out she had cancer. She could no longer work. But when she stopped working, she lost the right to health care because our health care status is tied to our immigration status. Th this is the system we've created. She needed her community to support her in raising the money to be able to access that cancer care. Uh, by the time she got that support and that money, it, it was too late. The cancer spread. Cancer doesn't wait. Our health doesn't wait. She had to fly back home and say goodbye to her family one month later. I'm shaking just even saying that story. You know, she's not alone. There are millions of people who don't have access to health care, but we here can do something about this. And I want, just like what Sarom said, every single day we can change this. We can fight for access to health care. But the most important thing is to fight for status for all. Amazing, thank you. Um, it's, you know, we heard today about these issues, housing, healthcare, um, labor rights, access to basic rights and justice, but also these stories of struggle Right. We know that people are taking action and speaking up for themselves. All of these are stories where we are not simply um, being acted upon. We're not simply vulnerable or precarious. We are powerful and our power comes in our collective unity. And I you know, thank you, Saram, for the invitation because in a lot of times when you are service providers and you're dealing with people coming to you one on one, you're trying to help them and then they're leaving. But they have, you know you can maybe help them with one thing, but they have a dozen problems. And you know, for that, it's not your department, you're not funded for it, etc. It is a very disheartening system. And so we need the ability for people to be able to take collective action. That's what um, these, our friends today are telling us about. I'm gonna now turn to, and try to dig in a bit more with each of you. So my next question is for um, 
Maybe I'll start again with Kazito, if that's okay. Um, I know, you know, I mentioned this earlier, you took these incredible actions, right, in support of refugees uh, who were on the, uh, underhoused and, you know, unable to get into the shelter system. And there's been so many twists and turns in this story. So can you share a bit about the strategies you use, right? Like what are all the strategies that you used uh, in that campaign, but also in any of the other campaigns that people can be inspired by and learn from? Uh, thank you, and, and I, I feel like I didn't do my homework on, on your first question about the stories, because um, there's endless stories. Um, the one, and I'll get back to this question, but the one story that I think people should have and keep in mind is, um, it's brutal on the streets. Um, w just two weeks ago, we took in about 65 people uh, into one of the churches, um, and I know some of the people that we are doing these advocates with do not agree that we take people into churches, um, some of us just refuse to have them on the street, and maybe it's because they happen to be, for example, for me, they're in front of our office, so I see them every day I go to work. Um, but um, one of the, the migrants that we took in was a pregnant lady who was sick, mm -hmm. and as soon as we took them in is when we realized that they were actually, there was nobody taking care of them. There was one person who had HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. Nobody had budget to find out whether they needed medication or not. And we also had another person that got arrested um, and because they went through a mental health episode. And this is somebody who was working. They had a job already. So we're not talking about people who are just there sleeping, doing nothing. These are people that are ready to go to work. These are people that are ready to contribute to our society. And so um, it's brutal. And we've put so much on, on the pastors and, and others and endless of volunteers. This work is being done by volunteers with no minimum to zero dollars that we've received so far from the city. And we are looking at ways to find w more funds until obviously you've heard from the minister until they can do something that what we call a real and tangible solution. Um, in terms of um, um, strategy or tactics, I, I'd be lying to you if I told you there was any. Um, but I'll, I'll take you back a little bit. What I didn't share is um, I was born in Rwanda. I lived through the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsis. Um, I came to Canada in 2000 as a refugee from uh, Kenya, and about 2009 to 2012, I went through a period of um, suicide and, 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 and wanting to commit suicide because I had gone through trauma and, and, and PTSD, and I was lucky to survive that. And when I was done, um, when I um, recovered, I decided to share my story, and this is how my organization was born. But before that, um, I wanted to do something in terms of raising awareness to PTSD. So I planned to do a walk from Toronto to Montreal um, in winter, which I did in 2016. And not only did I do that, I did it pulling a ricochet. <laughs> and my reason for the ricochet was to demonstrate all of the hell that I had gone through. So I was about to go back to Rwanda for the first time in 20 years, and I wanted to take the same route I took coming to Canada. So I walked from Toronto to Montreal because initially I, I landed in Montreal and lived in Montreal for four years. So I walked there, um, 17 days of cold, but beautiful, <laughs> crazy. Um, and so from that, what I've learned is you've got to, if you're looking to do something and you want people to help, You've got to be, you, you've got to do something that makes people believe that you're in it and you're in it for the right reason. Um, and so since then, my community, my Rwandan community have been with me ever since. We've done uh, so many incredible things, including some of the work we're doing on affordable housing. Uh, right now, we've just released uh, an affordable housing model. We call it the African-Canadian Affordable Housing Village model. And we're looking to implement uh, uh, that model and build some villages of Africans across Canada, hopefully. Um, but for this, particular, um, for this particular crisis, I just happened to be in, in the right place at the right time or in the wrong place at the right time um, because people just started like around June 1st, numbers started growing in front of our office. Um, I remember throughout the mayoral campaign, we were going through all of the, the mayoral campaigns and basically asking, what are you going to do when you become mayor? Uh, we talked to Olivia Chow, we talked to others 
And what she had promised to do was to bring us in, which she did. Um, we were hoping for a swift and fire, like we thought we were gonna get a response quickly. And obviously we are here now three, four months in and people are still on the street. Um, but it, it was really just being in the right place. At the, again, I don't even know if that, that, <laughs> that's the proper way to look at it. Um, but of course, um, being surrounded by leaders within the black community that wanted to do the right thing. Um, having done some work in the community previous to that, it was easier to reach out to people. Um, so I also didn't mention my background is film school. And one of the things we learned to, when, you, when you get into that industry is you can only do what you're capable of doing. And you have to be able to trust that others will do what they are capable of doing. So you just got to play your role. And that's really what I say um, I've always done. Uh, I continue to do. We've done so many collaborative work within our community. And I just try to do what I'm capable of and trust that others are going to do um, what they're good at. And, and it turns out to work sometimes and not always. It's not always, like I wouldn't say we've won in this one, um, but at least people know that Canada is doing something. Um, I've, I've heard all day about out there internationally, everybody thinks Canada is, is a wonderful land of milk and honey. And I continue to believe that but what we are doing to migrants and asylum seekers, um, if we continue to do that, I might have to change my mind about it because this is not a country I came looking to be part of. And I hope that we, we respond to this issue and, and do so urgently. Wow, thank you. Um, you know, you said so many things about, you know, the necessity of being, taking that courageous step, which you did you know, being in it for the right reason, doing your role and trusting others, which means organizing others to do what you must do uh, and do what they do best, which means finding uh, the good. And thank you again for reminding us. Um, I just want to say, we're going to hear from Sir Roman and then Diana, and then we will turn to the mic. So feel free to start thinking about your comments and your questions. Um, so I want to turn now uh, to Sir Roman. Let me just, um, of course, here we go. Um, I know that over the last several years, migrants have won, you know, incredible victories, right? Sometimes we forget, you know, since 2020, just even since COVID, you know, there was a time when there was even a question if undocumented people or migrant workers would get COVID testing or vaccination. I mean, we won that, right? That didn't just happen. Uh, there was the temporary resident to permanent resident program. There was the change where 100,000 international student deportations were stopped. The postgraduate work permit was extended. We heard about care workers. I mean, care workers used to need to, to finish 24 months of work, but now it's down to 12. I mean, these are collective victories, right? Uh, and so I know you've been involved from, in, in quite a few of those. So again, I would ask, what are some strategies that you um, are aware of or have tried or want to suggest to people, just a few, uh, in how to win uh, change and how to you know, remain steadfast uh, in this work? So I'll share two strategies. One is around support. There are two kinds, uh, and one is around campaigns. So around support, there's the direct support that, you, that we do, which is we have a hotline, we get questions from uh, current and former international students and other migrant workers, and we are able to um, connect them to resources and also be able to you know, speak up for themselves. To give you an example, I'm sure Diana will touch on this, but, you know, just in the past uh, two years, we've been able to win back 80,000 in hospital bills for uh, international students, one of whom was a... Yeah, and they did it themselves, you know, and one of them was having a baby. She was in the um, intensive care unit and was being charged for 30,000. They wouldn't let her hold her baby but we were able to support her directly um, to speak up for herself. And then now she's able to join the organization and want to also speak together in a collective voice. What our organization also does is do peer-to-peer -peer support because the thing is, it's very tough. Even when migrants and you know, international students are able to maybe fit, you know, address their immediate issue, there's the 
others that make it very hard, including being separated from families, trying to navigate a new country, not feeling like they have time to breathe when they have to go to school and study and then work and then work again and then travel for two hours because housing near their school is so expensive. They need people like them. And I think this is where we can come together, where we are able to have a community. You're able to send people and work with uh, and collaborate work so that they have a space where they can meet with others like them and kind of navigate and process this together. What our organization also does is um, unite people cross sectorally, right? And that shows greater power. So it's actually international students alongside farm workers and care workers who are out there um, having events together, sharing stories about problems at work and figuring, making their own solutions together and having creative ideas, right? The thing is, our people, and we are all very creative and innovative, but we just need supports, right? As you said, we can each play our role, right? There are so many things that we can do. In terms of campaigns, we've won many changes that Hassan has said, and it means that our individual actions, they really matter, right? You were talking about um, marching, right? Um, and, or walking, and actually in July 2021, a thousand migrant and undocumented people marched on Ottawa, came from places across the country and marched on Ottawa. And a couple months later is when, in December 2021, is when Prime Minister Trudeau put, made a mandate letter commitment to regularize undocumented people. There is a historic opportunity we have ahead of us where we can change the rules and regularize all undocumented people. And you heard the minister today, his heart is in it but we just need to make sure that there are no delays because every delay is more crisis. And then specifically around international students because this is prob probably what you're hearing too, is that there were things like the removal of the 20 hour work restriction on study permits that we campaigned for and won, but that public policy is coming to an end at the end of this year. And our members from across the country are fighting to Renew, uh, make that uh, removal permanent because nobody can work and survive. Nobody can work 20 hours and survive. If that public policy comes back, international students will continue to be working, but with in dangerous conditions and with even less rights. And that's not something any of us want. And around postgraduate work permits, that's also we have won just in the past two years three renewals to the postgraduate work permit. It's time for a permanent renewal. And only we can do that together. And these actions have only happened because we are united in our actions. So we can figure things out together. Again, I really invite you to you know, have us at your next meeting. We can brainstorm together. And I'd also love to hear from uh, you about what you're hearing from um, migrants, uh, migrant workers and students so that we can um, learn from you as well and continue that conversation. Thank you so much. Again, you know, bringing together these questions around immediate needs and direct support, but also building solidarity between. I know I'm sure you folks have many programs, probably have one program in, on your own workplace for women, another one for youth. Maybe there's a place for have those people actually intermingle. I know a lot of our services are, you know, language specific but, and region specific, but there's so many opportunities to coordinate because People have shared interests and they build linkages exactly as you said. And thank you again for reminding us about creativity and individual actions. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Diana and just a reminder, we'll have Q&A uh, comments and questions, not just questions after that. But um, Diana, um, the rollback of healthcare for uninsured clients in Ontario, I wanna say last, this May, um, May? March. Right, March, you know, was a crisis. I'm sure many of you knew just during the COVID period, anybody could get hospital care uh, and the province was funding for it. It was pulled back and it began a series of, you know, demonstrations, reports were written, the health network wrote a report, uh, advocacy, you know, letter writing campaign, all of these things and which attempted to get this thing that, you know, the basic right to healthcare. Now, of course, that struggle is ongoing. Uh, we do not have healthcare um, for uninsured people right now, but can you share maybe again, one or two strategies that people can take home with them? Yeah, definitely. I first want us to take a second to take in that we won. 
right? We won something together. After years of advocacy, pushing for health for all, we won. Let's, let's have a round of applause for that. Let's feel that. It was huge. It impacted the people we see every day. People could get health care, and it happened overnight. We've been told for years that it can't happen. We don't have the resources, but it happened overnight. I want us to feel that. Don't let anyone tell us that there are not enough resources. Yes? Yes. So I'll share a little bit of what we've done together. And by we, I mean um, the, the Health Network for Uninsured Clients. We came together with other healthcare workers, healthcare professionals. We came together, we started this coalition. As soon as we heard that they were, this government was trying to take back, roll back all these pandemic measures that came in that were life-saving. Um, first one, and it, and it makes sense to talk about this first one, given that the immigration minister was here, was that we approached local and provincial politicians, bureaucrats, we approached them. We did not back down. We did not, you know, sometimes we can get nervous oh, there's a politician, maybe we, we, we have so much that we're seeing on a day-to-day, -day. maybe we can't go to them. We should be making sure they do not leave until they do what we want them to do. Yes? Yes, please, yeah. We need to feel that. They're not celebrities. So that was one of our first tactics. You know, we pushed our local and provincial politicians to bring this up, speak up. Have them publicly support this in the legislature. That was really important. Then for us, we needed to also get equipped with maybe some of the skills that we need to be able to speak up. So as this coalition, you know, we did these media trainings with ourselves. We, we did, you know, we wrote these press releases. You know, we garnered, garnered as much media attention. If you haven't done this before, you know, connect with others that haven't. You know, it's important that our voices are there, that we learn how to, to, to speak up, take up space. We took up space on social media. You know, we know that's just one very quick thing that we, we all have that we all can do. We gave out social media kits. We did petitions. You know, just these basic, basic things that, um, that bring us together, that educate people about these issues, that, that allow us to take these, these actions one by one. Because it's a series of actions that we have to take together to win these things. Um, we... We went, we did a press conference in front of the Queen's Park. You know, I can keep going down the list. We had hundreds of supporters and allied, other allied groups join us. At the time, we had, you know, the education workers that are, you know, are super fiery and hot, um, that you, you've seen them uh, fighting for just basic, basic, uh, basic rights. Um, they came out and supported us. Um, one of one of the biggest contributions as, as a network, if you're involved in networks, like in mobilize your networks um, to, to advocate to get involved. One of the biggest things we did was we wrote a report of the amazing life-saving impact that this program had uh, for our people. And we, we interviewed our, our members, which are, you know, many of you service providers. We interviewed you and your experience and how it what alleviated your work to not have to think about, oh, I can't, I, I have to tell this person, no, that you don't have access. Um, so we wrote this report and we had it cited uh, countless times. We made our own evidence. You know, we can do those things. We, we, hadn't, we hadn't written a report ever before. And we, we came together and we did that. We, we did interviews, we wrote it, and we said, this is a groundbreaking program. Do not, do not cut it. And these are just some of the basic strategies that we use leading up to when the cuts did come. And it was a rollback of a lot uh, of cuts, so we have many more work to do. But just to give you an idea of just really, really basic things that you can do, if you haven't done it, you can start doing it today. Awesome, thank you so much. And you know, really encouraging people to kind of start where you're at. Um, and I also really appreciate this idea that, you know, your work matters. Your voices matter, right? There's this notion that each of you, the work that you do, you are the experts in some ways because you're hearing all these stories and just putting them together is evidence. Um, I don't see any people on the mic. Does anybody? Yes, please, go ahead. 
Thank you for um, your powerful stories that you shared and the advocacy strategies. I'm asking a question on behalf of an online participant. There is fear about advocacy because our funding officers can be nasty. How can we support the big campaigns like Status for All without risk of losing IRCC funding? Because that will, too, hurt our clients. We'll take a few more questions and comments. Is anybody else feeling, like, excited? Comments, as I said, you know, we're really, I know it's the end of the day. You've been here for a few days. Maybe you can reflect on any of it. Any open? No. Let me, let, I'll let you ponder that. Who wants to speak about this question? Um, I, I, I can go ahead. And, and for me, it might not be an answer that um, the person who just asked that question would love. Um, honestly, and this is something that even internally we are beginning to struggle with because of the noise we've made at the city. Um, some of the agencies that have helped us are beginning to get audits because of the, the effort that we are pushing. Um, but so what? What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? We just, you know, be silent because the person who we are advocating to is the same person responsible for funding us? I... Um, one of the things, and I believe sometimes that's an easy um, question to answer when um, you know what your calling is in life, because no matter what, I'll be doing this. Whether, and, and by the way, we, my organization is not funded, zero iota for what we've been doing on, on the street of, of the streets of Toronto. Um, and even when sometimes there is an approach for us to be funded, I've found that it's not appropriate because it needs to go to the churches directly. So. Um, honestly, I'll say, so what? Let's go for it because at the end of the day, like I always ask people to, to imagine, and this is not my line, it's a line from um, some of the motivational speakers. Um, you have to imagine yourself at the end of your life when you're about to die and you ask yourself the question, could I have done more? Could I have been better? Could I have been more active and responsible? If the answer is no, then, you know, like it's, it's a question you should always ask yourself when you're faced with a tough decision like that. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, even if it means not getting funded again, I will still push mm -hmm. because that is what we need to do. Otherwise, we're going to disappoint individuals like Mr. Gabriel, who is saying we are a culture of silent individuals because most of the people that are really in the position to advocate effectively are the same people that are funded by the same, you know, whether it's the federal government, the provincial, or the cities. So if we don't speak, it's going to remain the status quo. And I will say, go for it, and the universe is going to respond for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I'll just quickly add in, um, and then also more questions would be great. Um, I think, as, as you said, though, though that's so important. And at the end, fear is a real thing. It's not easy to uh, raise this conversation, right? But I think there's a couple things that I can break down where it might be possible. One, the call for full and permanent immigration status for all has been endorsed by over 500 national civil society, national and you know multi other levels of civil society organizations in Canada, every, including every federation of labor in the country. Major environmental groups, social groups, um, even service providers have signed on to this call for permanent resident status. So one, you're in good company. You're in, you would add your voice to a chorus of others who, have, are, who are speaking up. And our greatest protection is each other in that we, if we speak up alone, it might be difficult and tough, but if we speak up together, there's also a base of support of others who might be in the same situation where we can fight back and speak back against any potential of you know, um, losing funding, right? I don't think that's going to happen because it's, we're doing it together. There's also, um, you know, just at the level of the workplace, there are different steps that we can take. Maybe, you know, I think it would be great if you and your organization were to sign on to this call for Status for All and endorse. Um, but raising it uh, with your coworkers when you go back into work the next day is one way to get the conversation started and choosing who to bring it up with. Maybe it's not the 
right now the executive director, but maybe it's like the other people that you work with, and maybe you, you five of you raise it with the ED. But you know, you are, you know your workplace the best, you know what the people are like the best, you have all the tools and skills um, and knowledge already to know how to have this conversation. And it is sometimes not easy, but fear is something that we can just cut through together as long as uh, we're there for each other. Um, and then if you, and if there are specific questions that you have about raising at your workplace, I think, you know, any one of us would also um, love to chat after the panel to strategize uh, together. Mm. Mm. Maybe I'll just quickly add, um, as a network, that is something that comes up. That's a real, that is a real fear. You know, as a network, we do have um, frontline workers, we have management, you know, we even have EDs attending, and sometimes our frontline workers, you know, are nervous to even be able to, to speak up. Um, even, like, even be able to speak to other coworkers, or that they're exhausted, that, you know, that this is what they really want and feel, um, but are having a hard time bringing it up in their, in their own organization. So what's really amazing you know, with this network, we bring you together. It's a little bit of a space removed from the workplace, and then we hear from each other. It's like a peer support network, right? We hear from each other like, oh yes, this, we're seeing this, you know, access to healthcare, uh, many people without status going through many different issues. We're seeing this, um, and I want to raise it with my organization. Has anybody else raised it? So even joining these peer support networks that probably already exist, if they don't exist, create them. Like this health network was created, uh, you know, 20 years ago because, because what we're feeling right now, which is that we need to change. We need to change things. Things need to change, and we can be that change. And and by creating this network, you know, we um, and the legacy of those who came before me. <laughs> Uh, one changes, just even this small network, one changes, newborn OHIP, like before mothers had, were, when their children were born here, their kids couldn't access OHIP. We won that in 2009, and if it was fear that stopped us, then we wouldn't have won that. We can't let that stop us. Find a way, and we're here to hopefully support you in that journey in doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm just going to add a couple of more strategies just to do the mix for folks, you know. So one thing is this notion of, you know, first try to really identify what it is that you're trying to do, right? Your workplace may not be ready to march on the street. It may not be ready to even sign a petition or put out a statement. So what is possible, right? So we have this notion that we call, you know, the spectrum of centering migrant leadership. It's a spectrum. Obviously, um, what and we actually provide trainings to organizations to map and say, okay, where are you and how can you just go one step forward? What's the next step for your organization? So mm -hmm. that's something I'd love to come and speak to any of you about. The other thing is we've seen, for example, a number of community legal clinics in Toronto have started doing this because their funding is so tied to one-on-one -on -one service provision mm -hmm. is that they have created kind of a network of their clients, right? And then... Mm -hmm it's the clients doing the thing, right? It's not you. And that's where the real power is, right? So, and, so it's about establishing space for that. Um, and then of course, if you can't do that, then as there are you know, our organizations which will take any of your clients who are interested in doing something. So you could refer them to us, not for services, but referring people for action, right? This idea that, we have this notion, oh, I, someone else will help you get your housing. Well, where will you go to be part of collective change? So that's what we also um, function as. But I think there's also, you know, for example, it's Halloween on October 31st. So we're actually inviting people in their groups, you know, if you've got a group happening this weekend, to paint pumpkins with status for all, right? It's a simple thing. I, I seriously doubt your boss is going to try and stop you from doing that, right? And then post a photo, right? <laughs> there are s ways in which you can be creative, as Sarom had said, that can really make, um, make it possible um, to get through this while, you know, we know that we're often faced with a culture of silencing. It's something that's happening 
uh, right now on so many important issues. So just trying to figure out how to navigate your way through this. Are there any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. um, so oh, yes. I just wanted to add one thing uh -huh. um, to that. Um, and, then, and then we'll wrap up, so yeah. yes, please. Your so, last words. Good stuff. Uh, right now I'm just adding to what you're saying in terms of what is it, because everybody's approach is different, and I think that's what you're just saying now. Um, just recently, we were asked um, of us, this, one of the strategy was to take migrants um, into a particular location, uh, a public uh, location, and we, we refused to do it because we didn't want to denigrate and, and to, to use our people as tools. So there is always ways you are comfortable with, and I think you should always do the thing that you're most comfortable with. And if a few within the group are not comfortable with it, I think you should, should always also find the, the, the best possible solution because you don't want to get to a point where people start internally fighting on the wrong or the right way to do things. So um, one of the challenges right now we're facing is how do we advocate for our people without them being a part of the, 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 the image because most of them do not have status, most of them do not... A lot of them are coming here for different um, prosecutions back home. So how do you advocate for people without involving them? Even if they wanted to be part of it, they might not know whether that's the, they might want to, but is it really what they want to do? If they look back five years from now, are they proud they did that? Or did they do it because they didn't understand the environment and the policies, they, you know? So uh, it's always good to kind of balance it and make sure that everybody's on board and do the thing that everybody's comfortable doing. And, and that also comes in culturally, you know, for example, in Canada, people demonstrate, do, for example, my community, the African Canadian, do we, do we want to do that? Or is there another way to do it? That, but that's also effective. And uh, what we try to do is do both, you know, work with groups that are demonstrating, advocating internally, externally, and make sure that everybody um, is doing, like I say, doing, playing their role and making sure that everybody's comfortable with what they're doing. Um, is, is what I would say, and I would say even that's that's my last word. And, 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 and but I, I want to go back and and and, and, and because I, I loved um, the keynote speaker, Mr. Daniel, and his call for us not to be silent. Um, my call to you is, um, and it's what I said earlier. If you can reach an MP, uh, it could be your own issue in your own writing in your own neighborhood. I was just speaking to somebody who is from Niagara, where some of our asylum seekers are. Uh, now, We've, the IRCC have been taking some of them, they've taken about 300 to Windsor and, 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 and Niagara. Um, whatever the issue is, don't be silent. You can send an email, you can make a phone call, it's in your right to do so. And they respond to that. Mm -hmm. They respond to that more than you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually more powerful than us sending, let's say, the mayor of Toronto to talk to a minister. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you, mm -hmm. uh, using all these strategies that you are, you are shared by uh, my colleagues here to, to take action and reach out to your MP and whether it's the status for all, which is my new cause. <laughs> and I think somebody here has a hand up as they have a question. The mic, the mic here. It's, it's really not. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Oh. Hi, hello. So uh, I, as action, I would love to add, because uh, the peer communication is very strong, obviously. There was a guy in charge who is a government employee, uh, the minister, who is paid by the taxes. We could tell him and address everything that was said directly to him as well. This wasn't done. Two, uh, in Iceland, two days ago, you know what happened? Strike for all women for wage gap, yeah? Mm -hmm. Underpaid. Mm -hmm. I do call, but uh, as majority dominated by women, so it's up to them to decide to go for a strike. <laughs> That's what I call for. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so we're going to ask just taking Kizito's lead, I'm going to ask Sarom and Diana, like, just what's... Great. Um, yes, thank you. Um, just what is your call? So maybe I'll ask to start with Diana and then wrap with Sarom. Just like one minute, 30 seconds, what's your call? 
uh, like because you know made you know don't be silent status for all. Diana, what's your call? Can we take a second to take action right now? I I think my call is is like every minute, every day we can be doing something, um, and I know I'm supposed to be speaking about like what's something that you should do next week. But I think we can do something right now. Um, shall we do it together? Let's do it. What, what, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Let's pull out our phones. Well, I don't have a phone. And let's go to statusforall.ca. Because I think that's the common theme for, for, for what we're talking about today. Let's Let's t take out our phones, let's go to statusforall.ca, and let's send a message together. This needs to be the message that you leave with today. This needs to be the action you take now. This needs to be the action you took yesterday. So let's do it. So you go there, you hit take action, and you put in all your information. Yeah. And then hit send message. Okay. When you're done, you just raise your hand so we know you're done. I'll do my man. Back. <laughs> Here, you can use this one. Okay. Just put in your information. What's there? Oh, press there. there. Okay, we've got one person done, great. <laughs> Two, three, amazing, four, five, awesome. Okay, okay, it's happening. I see the numbers going up. Yes, yes. done, cool, cool. You hit the red button, oh, yeah. Yes, right? Mm -hmm. Got okay. two on that side. Uh, I think I think it's Three on that side. Yes. Okay. Well. Hands are slowly going up. <clears throat> okay. This is all right, Throm. What's your last call? Please continue to uh, put your hands up as uh, you sign the petition, and that way you'll also be on an email list where you'll get updates about events, including the one that's happening on Halloween on Tuesday, October 31st around painting and delivering pumpkins. I think I won't repeat what others have said, but this panel, uh, this, the, the theme has been resistance and renewal. And what I'm hearing is that so many of us have shared issues, right, around defunding and underfunding and the way that's impacting us at our workplaces and also impacting migrant and undocumented people and working class people who are coming through our doors. And these are shared issues. There is massive underfunding in public uh, post-secondary education and, that's, and, and an increasing privatization. There's massive, and that's also being facilitated by a revolving door of temporary migration. And that's really what I'm hearing all of us have our hearts and our minds in. And so I think I have, instead of, I have two questions, right? Which is, will you continue to take action on united issues so we can resist, renew, and fight for a better now. And if you, are, if you will do that, put your hand up. Put your hand up. If you will do that, if you will stay united, you will talk to your colleagues and talk with each other. And keep your hand up and turn that hand into a fist. And we'll see you at our next action, at our next meeting, and let's continue the conversation. Um, please take our flyers. We'll have them at the front, and we'll hand them out where you can get more information about our hotlines, and we can stay connected. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Debbie, you're up. <laughs> Once again for our panel, thank you so much. You're going home with a call to action. Okay, so 
We are at the end of, for another year, two and a half wonderful, wonderful days of conversations, of celebrations, of debates, of learning,